Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It's Thursday, November 7th, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the five time award winning majority report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA on today's program. Mohammed Janad, professor of anthropology at Mass Massachusetts College of Arts. We're talking about Kashmir, what the Modi government has done, the role of Kashmir in peace and security in South Asia. Is there a role for China as an underreported crisis deepens on the subcontinent letter released today on the eve of a supreme court decision in brazil that may be delayed again or it may finally release political prisoner lula da silva accusations of irregularities have not been proven but the crisis accelerates in Bolivia after Evo Morales' election to a fourth term. Some people doubted it for some reason, but Bernie Sanders has unveiled, of course, the most left-wing comprehensive immigration plan, the only candidate to call for a full breakup of ICE and the CPB. Time to fa break up Facebook, Sanders says, after leaked documents showed the giant social media, the uh, Facebook treated user data as a bargaining chip, apparently to help improve connectivity. Erdogan says that the U.S. is not fulfilling its Syria deal ahead of Trump talks. Two former Twitter employees have been charged with spying for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, digging into accounts of the kingdom's critics and giving all of their personal information to the kingdom. Incidentally, they're charged, but they're both in Saudi Arabia. Bill Gates. I thought that was McKinsey's job. Right, I, indeed. Bill Gates. It's almost like he isn't actually a positive force in the world. It's almost like a billionaire oligarch will have any tantrum about taxation and threaten to vote. And maybe make the worst uh, defense of philanthropy that we'll hear all year. Indeed. Demonstrations to Chile spread. In Iraq, forces murder 13 protesters in a renewed crackdown as the movement against austerity continues. Secret gerrymandering ring files can now be made public, a court rules. The Republicans plan to suppress the vote. And Trump wanted Barr to hold a press conference saying that the president broke no laws in a call with the Ukraine leader. All that <clears throat> and much, much more on today's majority report. Sorry, folks. I think I'm losing my voice a little bit. I'm realizing as, uh, it's going around. as we got into game time. It's weird. I don't feel anything else other than that. Um, billionaires shouldn't exist. Bernie Sanders gets that. Billionaires are a structural threat to democracy. There is no, no accumulation of wealth, no matter how a quote unquote benign it might be, that does not involve monopoly, worker abuse, market concentration, political rigging, what have you that could create that level of wealth concentration. It's impossible in terms of reality. For some reason in this country, and uh, Connor Kilpatrick actually just made this point, I think it was an Amber Frost point, if I remember correctly, that the, the British overclass sort of does a favor 
because they are so horrifying and gruesome. They actually do things like fox hunting and sort of, you know, look at what uh, what bo- what bogs. I think is that mogs or bogs. Uh, Jonathan Reese Mog. Jonathan uh, Reese said that Mog. the Grenfell Tower people were just too stupid to leave or something like that. Right. One of the literally a aristocrat on the Tory front bench is so transparently evil and grotesque that he would say that about the Grenfell uh, Tower. Now, in America, our oligarchs are the same, but they wear sweaters and they talk about philanthropy and they talk about doing good. Now, incidentally, Bill Gates uh, waged a war against public education and teachers in this country, which has been a, well, I think it's been a success in terms of what it was actually trying to do, but certainly not a success in improving education in this country. And he has a creepy and bizarre obsession with African birth rates, which I'm sorry, I find that kind of disturbing. Uh, But there has been this delusional brand built in the American psyche that some of these people who look, again, some of them might be perfectly nice people, might even have nice intentions. But in fact, The structural reality of their wealth is antithetical to democracy. And when push comes to shove, most of them are going to vote in accordance with that. So even a absolutely minuscule wealth tax like the one Elizabeth Warren is putting on the table, basically a tax on Bill Gates's couch change. I think the number, I think he's worth... He's worth at least 20 billion. And I think if at 2%, I think it would be like 100 million, which... uh, Obviously, he's more in a lifetime for over 90% of people. But for Bill Gates, I mean, I don't know. He wouldn't even need to sell a jet uh, to to chip that off to the federal government. But, oh, boy, did that lead to a meltdown. And I would say along with all of the uh, photos of him with Jeffrey Epstein, maybe a ongoing, maybe a ongoing mask off moment for Bill Gates. Now, somebody can say I'm very biased since I've been a prime beneficiary of the existing system. Uh, but, Duh. you know, I'd, I'd love to somebody to find a middle ground approach because the government's role in health care and better education, the government does need more resources than it has today. And so what would you do? I, I, well, if you make the tax on capital the same as labor, uh, you go back to the... Uh, yeah, we just, just recently the, um, Saiz and Zuckman discovered the, or, uh, research showed that capital, uh, taxes on labor is higher than taxes on capital. Right. The idea that we'd make them even is ludicrous. Like that's ludicrous. not a middle ground. No. Uh, capital should be taxed far, far higher than labor. Let's put it in simple terms. Uh, your, uh, you know. Wall Street stock speculation by rich people or being a landlord should be taxed at a higher rate than your job. Tax on capital, the same as labor. Uh, you go back to the estate tax that we used to have. Uh, doing wow. something like the 10-year thing, you know, where it's super large fortune. The, the big fortunes are not, as Piketty says, a return on capital. The big fortunes are the return on creating companies that achieve very strong positions, particularly in the technology industry. That's where you get these super big numbers. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so pause there, it. yeah. Bill Gates created such a pernicious t- monopoly in technology that at the end of the Clinton administration, that administration was going after their monopolistic practices. And the Clinton-Gore administration presided over some of the most expansive deregulation of Wall Street and the first late 90s tech bubble. His practices were so predatory and monopolistic that it caught the attention of the late 90s Clinton Justice Department. You get these super big numbers. Uh, and so there, you know, I've uh, paid over $10 billion in taxes. I paid more uh than anyone in taxes, uh, but I, you know, I'm glad to have paid. You know, if I'd had to pay 20 billion, it's fine. Uh, but you know, when you say I should pay 100 billion, okay, then I'm starting to do a little math about uh, what I have left over. Sorry, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, Six billion dollars. So, 
You really want the incentive <laughs> system to be there, and you can go a long ways without threatening that. Have you ever talked to Elizabeth Warren about any I've of this not. before? Would you? Would you want to? You know, I'm not sure how open-minded she is. Uh, <laughs> uh, or that she'd even be willing to sit down with somebody, you know, who has uh, large amounts of money. Um, okay, so let me make it complicated oh. for you. You've been, uh, oh, uh, I'll politely say, public about your misgivings about our current president. If Elizabeth Warren were the other candidate, what would you do? You know, I, I'm not going to, you know, make political declarations, but I do think no matter what policy uh, somebody has in mind, a professional approach uh, is even, as much as I disagree this with all the coded. policy things that are out there, I do think a professional approach to the office. Whoever I decide would have the more professional approach in the current situation <laughs> probably will weigh, is the thing that I'll weigh the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and, nah. you know, I hope the more professional candidate is an electable candidate. Nah. Yeah, exactly, Bill. More professional approach. What does that even mean? Couldn't agree more. It means don't tax him. Jesus, I even get it, Brendan. Now, of course, the other element of why you have a we should have a way bigger wealth tax uh, is for the sake of democracy. We'll get to the numbers in a second. I just want to say, Elizabeth Warren, uh, the the team sent out a awful tweet saying that she would be happy to sit down with Bill Gates, which is. Uh, look, I'm always happy to meet with the people, even if we have different great, uh, views. Bill Gates, if you get a chance, I'd love to explain exactly how much you'd pay under my wealth tax. I promise you it's not $100 billion. Now, Elizabeth Warren last year refused to go on Fox News uh, for some uh, very well-argued reasons. I don't happen to agree. I think as disgusting as it is, it is the largest cable network, and you're running for president. You're going to be on it, and indeed— Warren was regularly on Fox News before the commencement of the campaign. But she did say, look, I'm not going to go on a racist network uh, promoting Trump's uh, terrorism at the border. And again, I think if you're running for president, you have to go on Fox. And indeed, uh, Bernie did an incredible job on Fox. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, and this is really hard for me to say, uh, personally in Fox's studios along with Bernie, uh, criticized uh, you know, Fox's racism and capitalist propaganda, as an example. I I think it's very disturbing Elizabeth Warren does not bring the same energy to Bill Gates, who, in terms of reality, is a way bigger threat and impediment than the average Fox viewer. And, of course, the point is to get to the viewers, not the network. The network, in this case, is the medium, right? So to say... I won't potentially reach millions of people. And even if it's only 10,000 people that say, you know what? I like that policy set. I'll vote in a better way. But then all of a sudden you'll turn around and be kind of obsequious to an obscene oligarch who has basically just revealed that for all of the branding and all the bullshit that a modest wealth tax is enough for him to, to, at the very least, consider voting for Donald Trump. I would say almost certainly he would vote for Donald Trump or come up with some type of like made up, stupid, you know, third party campaign that would specifically function as a spoiler, like try to resuscitate Howard Schultz. So, uh, you know, very bad instincts there, in my view, from Warren and very revealing of billionaires aren't your friends, folks. Yeah, if a billionaire Gates wants to see Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, he should go to Iowa and uh, yeah, New Hampshire. Exactly. Go on the campaign trail, see if you can get a meeting. Why the hell should they sit down with you? And I think that's the message. You know, where, where, why do you get special treatment? Getting special treatment your whole damn life. Bernie Sanders' Twitter said, say Bill Gates was actually taxed at $100 billion. We could end homelessness, provide safe drinking water to everybody in this country. Bill would still be a multi-billionaire. Our message, the billionaire class cannot have at all when so many have so little. That's what it is. And incidentally, not particularly interested in listening to you laboriously try to get through a point about your greed while looking at the, you know, intentionally like do you see the holes at the soles of his shoes like the whole like yeah, i'm just a regular guy i don't yeah. i don't really like to spend that's it you know, that's even worse these billionaires that are like i drive a used car i have holes in my shoes 
disgusting. I mean, at the very least, make a little bit of the trickle down work. My God, go buy some friggin' cars. Employ some more people. You greedy morons. Humans have been shaving for thousands of years. But the secret to a great shave hasn't changed much. That's why Harry's doesn't overcharge you to add gimmicky features on their razors. Now, obviously, I have not been shaving much. I've been keeping a beard, but you still got to take care of the neck. You got to trim it. You got to keep things in shape. I use my Harry's razors for that exact purpose. I also have very sensitive skin. And the Harry's works with it, not against it, as so many other razors do. I remember when I first had the Harry's, it was the first shave I ever had where there wasn't any cuts. Now, maybe that's a problem with my form, but I think it also shows really the incredible weakness of so many other razors. Harry's is the blade that I use, whether I want a full shave or to help manage the beard I do have. Harry's is a return to the essential quality. Durable blades at a fair price, just $2 per blade. They've cut out the middleman by manufacturing blades in their German blade factory, which has been honing precision blades for a century. That means you get incredible high-quality bl blades at factory direct prices. There's no risk trying them out. If you don't love your shave, let them know, and they'll give you a full refund. Listeners to our show can re to, can redeem their Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash majority report. You'll get a weighted ergonomic handle for a firm grip, a five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel with aloe to keep your skin hydrated, and a travel blade to cover your razor, to keep your razor dry and, and easy to grab on the go. Go to harrys.com slash majority report to start shaving better today how much time how you spend your time and what you listen to is totally in your control your personal information however is a different story because when you shop bank or browse online your personal information is getting out there and you can lose it exposing you to cyber crime thankfully there's norton 360 with lifelock to help you get back a sense of control and protect yourself and your personal information. It's an all-in-one membership for cyber safety that gives, your that gives you device security, identity theft protection, and VPN for online, protect for online privacy and more. Plus, if there's an identity theft-related problem, they have agents who will work to fix it. Now, no one... Now, no one can prevent all cybercrime and identity theft, but Norton 360 with LifeLock is a powerful ally to help protect you in today's connected world. All I can say about this is that, and I make this point with anything like this, is that, first of all, you got to do it. There, I mean, look at these companies, look at how the, the web works. You got to protect your privacy. I found installing this in all of my devices to be incredibly easy. I didn't even need to uh, ask anybody for help, which says a mind-blowing amount. So get it, easy as anything. It's downloaded, it's there, boom. Now I know my information is being protected. Sign up today for LifeLock. Sign up today for Norton 360 with LifeLock membership. And as our listener, you'll save, seven, you'll save 25% or more off your first year at norton.com slash majority. That's norton.com slash majority for 25% off. And let's also talk about Joybird. Whether your style is more mid-century, modern, or boho, or you're not sure, your furniture should suit your needs while also feeling uniquely you. Need a sofa in a golden you or a love seat in the hottest red, as Matt has? An inviting baby blue, or even a plush green velvet, Joybird's got your back. Joybird offers a range of kid and pet-friendly upholstery options so that your creators, so that your creations can stand the test of time. Plus, all Joybird handcrafted pieces come with a limited lifetime warranty. And thanks to the 365 day home trial, you can sit on it, sleep on it, and break it in. Then, if you don't love it, Joybird. Then, if you don't love your Joybird, return it. 
Create furniture that matches your own fearless style at joybird.com slash majority25. That's the number 25. See how Joybird can help make your dream space a reality today at joybird.com slash reality25 at joybirds.com slash majority25. Go to joybird.com slash majority25 and ex- receive an exclusive offer for 25% off your first offer by using the code majority 25. Thanks, everybody. We're going to take a brief break, and we'll be right back with Mohammed Janad. Welcome back to the Majority Report. Joining us now is Professor Mohammed Junad. He's a professor of anthropology at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Junad, as you've asked me to call you, uh, Professor, as I'm tempted to call you, how are you? Thanks for being here. Uh, hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here with Majority Report. So can you start by just giving us a fresh sort of, we've talked about it on the show, but give us a re-review as to what has happened in Kashmir over the last several months uh, from the government in Delhi. Uh, so for those listeners who don't know uh, Kashmir so well, I um, just wanted to let you know that Kashmir is uh, at the heart of three major countries. All of them have nuclear weapons, India, Pakistan, and China. It's a Himalayan region with a long history, and uh, it became part of this dispute between India and Pakistan in 1947 when the British left the subcontinent, uh, leaving Kashmiris uh, uh, in a state of limbo because they were not allowed to decide their future, whether they would go with India, Pakistan, or whether they would prefer to remain independent. So in the aftermath of the partition in 1947, India signed these uh, this treaty with the ruler of Kashmir, who was not a representative figure for Kashmiris. It's called the Instrument of Accession. And based on that treaty, India had incorporated two key articles in its constitution, uh, Article 370 and Article 35A, which became a constitutional kind of link between India and Kashmir. 
Um, Article 370 was about Kashmir's autonomy, uh, that uh, most of uh, Kashmir's, uh, the decisions that affect Kashmir would be taken by assembly in Kashmir. Uh, except for defense, communication, and external affairs. And Article 35A was about land and permanent residency. Who could uh, live in Kashmir? Who could buy land, immovable property in Kashmir? And then uh, this system has uh, continued for uh, seven decades almost um, in a little watered-down form. But on August 5, uh, 2019, Indian government... Uh, withdrew and revoked Article 370 without consulting Kashmir uh, and Kashmiris and also revoked uh, 35A. Uh, all of this was done um, by uh, kind of uh, what Kashmiris perceive as deceit because most of Kashmir was put under a severe lockdown. Uh, people's phones were taken away. They could not call anyone. They could not connect with anyone. The internet uh, was shut down. Um, in a uh, So Right now, we are like four months into it, and that process has continued. Kashmiris have not been um, able to kind of express their opinion on what has happened uh, with these articles. And what, in terms of how you understand the government in Delhi's move, and you, you talked about the land issue, um, obviously there is a, you know, sort of the Hindutva dimension, and I'd like you to talk about the ideology of Narendra Modi and the BJP government. But is there also something going on here that may be in, you know, bear with me if the analogies aren't perfect, but something that's almost more analogous in some respects to uh, something like Puerto Rico or another kind of like there, basically that there's an opportunity to also do a lot of very primitive capital accumulation right now. You can get people off of pretty prime real estate um, some of the most beautiful places in the world. I haven't had the privilege of going, but at least even just kind of on a, uh, you know, as I've seen it represented in, in film and photography, there's ski slopes, there's, you know, there there's money to be made, capital to be accumulated. And in the clips of uh, sort of Indian sort of mainstream right-wing media that I've seen, there's certain, you know, there's the sort of stuff you expect with the, BJP Hindutva stuff and terrorism rhetoric and so on. But there I've also seen clips that are like, this is, you know, this is going to be a bonanza. There's great money making opportunities here. So what's the sort of relationship of what's happening here between a kind of broader nationalist project and consolidation and the identity yeah. politics of it and the capital accumulation dimension? Um, so we are living in a historically a moment when um, crony capitalism has met um, this nativist uh, kind of populist nationalism. And it's happening in a variety of spaces across the globe. India is a particularly uh, a potent case for this because um, it's the lives of 1.2, uh, 3 billion people that are at stake. Um, now, let me just like break it down a little bit. Um, the RSS, uh, which is currently the regime um, that uh, runs India, Narendra Modi is the prime minister, although he, his party is called BJP, but BJP is just a political front for RSS. Modi himself is a lifelong member of RSS. Mm -hmm. RSS uh, has its roots in 1920s. It emerged as a sort of a nationalist uh, organization taking inspiration from um, the rise of Nazism in Germany and fascism in Italy. It believed in uh, Hindu supremacist ideas. It believed in uh, eugenics and uh, believed that nationalism trumped every other consideration. You know, uh, So um, uh, being Indian is primary over being human. Um, so this is the party that kind of Hindu assassinated a member of it. This party assassinated Gandhi, and they came. They were kind of low lying uh, for a pretty long time. Although their ideas kind of were dispersed across the Indian political sphere, but in the 90s, early 90s, uh, when India was going this massive restructuring of its economy, where um, you know these IMF prescribed um, restructuration policies, uh, taking away f benefits from people, ending the public distribution system, uh, selling off the national assets to uh, domestic capitalists, all of this kind of coalesced uh, together at that time. And the nationalists 
nationalists supported uh, this domestic accumulation um, in the hands of a uh, few people like Ambani's, the Adani's, the Birla's and Tata's who were these big industrial houses in India. And uh, the, these uh, big capitalists um, kind of like used this nativist uh, national hyper-nationalist discourse uh, to get rid of the, uh, some of these democratic debates, democratic institutions, um, trying to uh, move, persuade people away from questions of inequality and economy towards um, fear-mongering, towards uh, creating internal threat. Um, and so all of this has led to a situation where in India, which is probably one of the uh, among the two top most uh, unequal societies in the world, where the top 1% of the uh, population um, owns basically 75% of the national wealth, um, where almost three quarters of wealth generated in the economy goes to the top 10% of the people. And, uh, you know, um, so this inequality has kind of coexisted uh, and uh, allowed this nativist rhetoric to um, go on. Um, now, with the revocation of 370 and 35A, the Indian government led by BJP and Modi wants to do two things in Kashmir. One, it wants to uh, demographically change uh, the region by bringing in Indian people who can, like, basically do, um, you know, come in, turn Kashmiris into a minority and remove um, uh, through demographic transformation the question of self-determination, which still remains uh, to be, um, you know, uh, addressed. Uh, a historic demand for, from Kashmiris. And second, and most potently, they want to sell off uh, Kashmir, um, the pristine lands of Kashmir, which is ecologically very fragile, to these crony capitalists uh, who have been supporting them, who have been funding their elections. Um, so all of that process has already begun. And so actually, so maybe it's also kind of like, in some ways, analogous to Tibet in terms of the kind of occupation and population engineering and also a huge amount of uh, ecological resources to be determined, so to be uh, acquired. Let's come back to India in a minute. Let's talk about the other two players here, and let's start with Pakistan. Um, it, I want to basically just balance. I mean, there's no doubt that obviously the sort of RSS propaganda and the main sort of perspective of justifying this behavior in terms of an international press and people who defend it, you know, they just sort of repeat terrorism talking points. Now, yeah. uh, and so, you know, that's important. I know you'll push back and debunk it. At the same time, I mean, obviously Pakistan has actually funded uh, some of these types of groups, even independently of Kashmir, going back to like the attack on the Oberoi Hotel in 2008, that great atrocity. And, you know, India and Pakistan have their own uh, dynamic, which in some ways it seems like Pakistan maybe, you know, has an even more kind of limited foreign policy in terms of its focus really specifically on, on India. So what is Pakistan's role here, both in terms of what part of Kashmir is in Pakistan and are, in fact, is the human rights situation on the Pakistani side better than on the Indian side or worse or equal? And to what extent has there been, not in the current escalation, I mean, the politics of that is obvious in terms of what's coming out of the nationalist crony politics of, of, of Delhi right now, but historically, have some of the groups and some of the things that Pakistani uh, Pakistan has funded, have they engaged in atrocities? Um, yes. Yeah, so let me first begin by saying that um, as a scholar of Kashmir, I don't see Kashmir necessarily as a territorial dispute between India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Although uh, globally, and the discourse on Kashmir has been basically captured by India and Pakistan. They claim mm -hmm. Pakistan claims it to be the unfinished business of partition, and uh, India blames Kashmir, uh, you know, Pakistan for all that is happening in uh, Kashmir. Um, so what Kashmiris have been trying to do from last 70 years is to center themselves and claim that Kashmir belongs to Kashmiris and Kashmiris should be the people who decide the, their fate and their future. Um, now, 
Of course, you know, 1947, uh, part of uh, Kashmir came under uh, Pakistani control, which meant that Pakistan became kind of like a party to this question. Um, and there are a lot of regions in uh, of Kashmir that are under uh, Pakistani control right now. Uh, so since 1947, um, India and Pakistan have fought several wars, uh, and most of these wars have happened, taken place over Kashmiri territory, affecting Kashmiris the most. You know, it's the Kashmiris who die in these wars. Um, in 1990, Kashmiris rose up in a uh, rebellion against the Indian control in mass protests, which were brutally suppressed. Uh, there were massacres, there's a, a litany of massacres, really, from um, uh, 1988 to 1990 that took place in Kashmir at that time, in response to which uh, young Kashmiri activists crossed over the line of control and went to the other side of Kashmir seeking arms training. While the Pakistani government at that time showed lukewarm response to this, uh, they lightly armed them, gave them 15 days training and sent them back. Most of these young Kashmiris kind of basically died as soon as they came in. Uh, thousands of Kashmiri militants who had uh, so basically ba barely any training uh, were dying. Right. And you have to remember, it is a time also when the Afghan situation is boiling over. Um, the Soviet Union uh, left Afghanistan and there's a war going on between Najibullah's regime and the, uh, the so-called Mujahideen. Who, who actually win, uh, and many of these militants are, are, are then like tra uh, transported into Kashmir by the Pakistani establishment. And the Pakistani establishment basically sought to create a constituency in Kashmir where the, the militants kind of, uh, the, the only ones who had uh, some power would be the ones who would speak the pro-Pakistan language, like that Kashmir should right. merge with Pakistan. And those Kashmiris, the majority who wanted to be independent and were fighting India for that, um, were slowly silenced, of course, by Indian repression, but also by Pakistani manipulation. Um, yes, um, many of these groups uh, that came into Kashmir were um, uh, Islamist. They were, uh, some of them believed in uh, jihad, some of them even believed in global jihad. But the overall sentiment in Kashmir has been centered on Kashmir. Uh, Kashmiris uh, are a pluralistic people. You know, we have a long history uh, of, uh, you know, being um, a, a, a plural society with uh, tolerating differences and like our uh, a very progressive past. And in fact, in 1940s, one of the major events was this adoption of this constitution called, uh, not a constitution, but a document called Naya Kashmir, which imagined a progressive, free, democratic, pluralistic Kashmir. Um, that sentiment has remained, and it's at the heart of the Kashmiri struggle for self-determination, because most Kashmiris believe, uh, of course, that India and Pakistan have not been able to be fair and just to Kashmiris, and India has, of course, uh, failed as an idea um, to, uh, to for Kashmir, so the only best solution is to basically, you know, uh, chart one's own course and uh, build a society, uh, a pluralistic society that Kashmir deserves. So, yeah, and this is really important. I just want to underline this. So, I mean, yeah, so international rhetoric and security rhetoric is India versus Pakistan. What is the Indian record there? Does India deserve it? What are the nation no, notions of nationhood in India? How does it relate to Kashmir? Then in Pakistan takes, um, you know, independent, uh, actors who want independence and actual autonomy for Kashmir and then obviously weaponize it for their own uh, nationalistic foreign policy aims and missed inside all of that is this ongoing reality that Kashmir really is an independent thing with its own uh, autonomous direction and desire which is suppressed um, by these two nationalist impulses. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is China's role in all of this? Um, so China's role, first of all, of course, it's, uh, as I said, it's the neighboring country. Its borders meet uh, Kashmir through Tibet, which it occupied in the 50s. 
and uh, part of uh, the historic territory of what was the state of Jammu and Kashmir before 1947 was taken over by China in 1962 during uh, India-China war. Uh, so China has territorial control over part of Kashmir, part of this historic state of Kashmir. Um, China is also an ally of uh, Pakistan, although much of uh, that alliance is built on, like you know, issuing statements, but not actually um, being a force on the ground. Um, while I mean, it's it has not provided to be a, a kind of like a stabilizing force in the region uh, and kind of has um, strong trade relations with India, although it has strong defense relations with Pakistan. So its role is kind of ambiguous and um, has not factored in, um, in in the Kashmir question as one would have imagined. So back to India, there's yep. another uh, notion which, which sort of connects uh, what's happened in, in, in Kashmir with a broader question about the nature of Indian nationhood. And, and I want you to clarify, I guess, first of all, that even before this significant escalation by the Modi government, that Kashmir was already a place with decades-long significant human rights violations by the Indian government. But also, yeah. is there something to the notion that for all of the imperfections and all of the contradictions in any number of areas there state of emergency in the 1970s pogroms against sikhs in the 1980s the occupation of kashmir that there still is this notion of indian pluralism coming from nehru that it again at least allows for some of this notion of autonomy in kashmir and now in this new state building project of the RSS, that India is being reconfigured along uh, anti-pluralist, nationalist lines, and that this is a sort of, you know, it's a second founding in a way, and Kashmir is ground zero for that. Um, so when you look at Kashmir from, uh, or India, or the Nehruvian project from, a Kash uh, from the perspective of Kashmir, from its margins, mm -hmm. um, there is really not that much of a difference. You know, um, the question of uh, a plebiscite or referendum was actually taken by um, in India itself. International leaders at that time had are uh, uh, told Kashmiris that they will hold a plebiscite so that Kashmiris can determine their future. And the um, betrayal of those promises, as Kashmiris call it, uh, begin almost with Nehru himself. In 1953, for instance, he arrested Sheikh Abdullah, who had endorsed the instrument of accession, and kept him in jail for like almost uh, a decade and a half, uh, and introduced uh, legislation through these things called presidential orders that uh, gradually took away uh, the content of the Article 370. Mm -hmm. um, so Nehruvian policies from the beginning, while they were pluralistic, re, um, almost like, you know, um, that there was a notion of uh, secular no uh, nation building, they were carried out in many parts of India. But uh, it, you have to also understand that India inherited, these national leaders inherited an empire from the Britain, uh, British, and they wanted to turn it into a nation state. And Nehru used the same kinds of colonial policies um, that the British had used in the subcontinent. I mean, um, if you look at India from the very beginning, it has been at persistent war with uh, different communities, nation, nationalities, nations, uh, groups, uh, and religious minorities from the very beginning. You know, from the bombings in Mizoram, uh, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in Manipur uh, in the early 50s, to war in Kashmir and arrests of national, Kashmiri national leaders, to the so-called police action, which was military brutality in uh, Hyderabad, to annexation of Goa, and all of these things have been kind of like continuously um, taking place. Um, I, we have also, uh, we have argued for a long time that Congress 
uh, kind of set the template that uh, Hindu nationalism almost, you know, um, basically adopted. The Congress Party. That, just for people. Yeah, the Congress okay. Party. The Congress Party set up that template. And, uh, you know, uh, although the rhetoric was secular, the rhetoric was uh, uh, national, where minorities were supposed to be included in, in, a, in different degrees, the Hindu nationalism basically used the same template of uh, imperial control, uh, except that they were going to give uh, primacy to the interests of one community. That's the Hindus. Right. Um, yeah. So now is the sort of where do we go from here question. Um, I think, you know, for an American and a global audience, there is the sort of way of trying to grip people's attention on this, which is, you know, there's so much worry about North Korea, but in fact, like the conflict between India and Pakistan and God forbid if India, if China got involved, that this could lead to maybe the most dangerous hot war on the planet. And then yep. uh, there's the other notion of really centering um, Kashmiri aspiration. So what, I mean, from those two frames, what do you see playing out? And then, you know, I mean, in fact, even what do you think is helpful? I mean, was the Bernie Sanders statement, uh, at least in terms of the clar you know, the clarity on Article 3, was that helpful? Uh, where do we sort of go from here in terms of the big kind of global threat level and then the urgent level of Kashmiri protection and self-determination? Yes. So I think that uh, it's a question of different scales. Uh, what happens at the regional level and what happens at the global level. Um, at the regional level, of course, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, Kashmir has to be centered because um, it is at, already at the center of this major conflict that is brewing up. As you said, there's been a recent report by American scientists which um, basically argued that any war, uh, in small war in the region could quickly go out of control and, uh, you know, cause millions of uh, deaths around the world and, you know, pay potentially destroy the planet. I mean, we're thinking here of like how these scales are connected. Um, so a solution has to be sought where uh, maybe an international agreement uh, between a trilateral agreement between India, Pakistan, Kashmiris uh, can emerge where Kashmir, instead of becoming this bone of contention between India and Pakistan, becomes like a bridge of peace where, you know, uh, India and Pakistan agree to give um, um, freedom to the respective regions and um, create open borders, create, uh, use Kashmir as a, a, a trade uh, route. Uh, I mean, Kashmir is also at the heart of cent Central and South Asia. So it's a, uh, I mean, uh, those things can happen at the regional level. Uh, locally, of course, you know, Indian government really needs to open up the communications, free political prisoners, and um, basically remove military from the civilian areas at, as urgently as possible because it's a unfolding humanitarian disaster. Now, globally, of course, we are seeing the rise of, um, you know, this uh, populist nationalism at a time of extreme inequality. Uh, we have to, uh, I mean, it's not ha not only happening in India, it's happening in the U.S., it's happening in Britain, it's happening in uh, Turkey, it's happening all over the world. And uh, we need to kind of... Um, return to the democratic ideals, we need to make our institutions much more representative um, of people's interests rather than, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, 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 of a space where the, these crony capitalists can twist policies that benefit only them. I mean, much of the, the ground forces of RSS, the stormtroopers of RSS actually come from um, low-income, lower-caste communities right. who who feel like you know they uh, you know because they have this right to inflict violence over Muslims and other minority communities they are somehow this is a they feel a sense of empowerment but it's not because they are still grinding under the feet of casteism and um, capitalism in these regions so we have to take all a kind of like a holistic approach to all of this within which a system a new system has to be built where human rights people's rights can be center of our focus and economic justice can be center of our focus absolutely and it really is i mean that is like precisely a global pattern 
um, in, in terms of the dynamic you just described there. Um, Professor Mohammed Janad, Professor of Anthropology at the Massachusetts College of Art of College of Liberal Arts. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you for leading us through this. Uh, thank you. So nice talking to you. Take good care. All right, folks. Um, I think, I mean, there's a lot more to talk about, but uh should probably be paying more attention <laughs> to. I think this, when he said destroy the world, I think I want to be specific. In that report, I think the implication was was that if there if they exchanged a certain amount of atomic bombs it could basically destroy like the global food production system because of radiation and uh that would be not good yeah there's a number of books um about nuclear sort of precarity right uh command and control is one i can't remember who it's by is that eric schlosser could be at least he wrote one of them he's a really good reporter um, fast food nation is a good book too yeah, that's awesome. yeah. and that is some pretty depressing reading like that was giving me you know when i get post trump i have a lot of these like very morbid it often happens at like 11 p.m at night where you're just like holy crap that's actually it's all time. happening we're in it we're like we've been joking around but actually it's happening right um uh, that before Trump, that used to be where it would come from for me is, oh, we need to do something about these nuclear weapons. Like even when Obama was in office, it's like, guys, can we just, can we just, uh, you know, maybe decommission all of these quickly before we destroy the entire planet? And then we're turns out we're going to destroy the planet in some other way, maybe. I mean, it's good to think about stuff like that and climate because it's like there are these literal foundation things like and it's so funny because they're both they're so elemental because it's literally a question of survival and then it's also does get to i mean for lack of a better word like religious themes like do we have a right to change the entire topography and climate balance of the planet not in some type of extreme deep ecology way like no humans are not going to just fold back into the woodwork but what is the ethics of completely transforming in every way, shape, and form in a negative way this planet that we inhibit with, inhabit with so many other beings? And then, you know, the, the nuke dimension. Like, it, it's amazing how it's like, on one hand, hey, do you want to survive and carry on future generations? That's a pretty simple question. And then the other, like, pretty deep moral stuff <laughs> around, like, private and public bureaucracies of like global destruction that are you know that they should be you know they're pretty weighty questions yeah daniel ellsberg wrote the doomsday machine which we actually interviewed him for this show 18 I yeah think. great interv great book as well i did and not i remember i went out and i skipped the gym that way that day yeah there's I think a, I literally went and just had like a pastrami sandwich, like whatever. Yeah, it's like that one, The Dead Hand by David E. Hoffman and yeah, uh, Eric Schlosser's uh, Command and Control. Three great books if you want to really terrify yourself in something besides fascism. Basically. Some, uh, yeah, and I'll give some more uh, creative and uh, recommendations for nuclear nuclear proliferation. Uh, End Zone by Don DeLillo. If you're trying to get into Don DeLillo, that's a quick one and kind of captures the American mind during the age of uh, the nuclear threat or the height of it really, I guess, in the Cold War. And then um, Acid West by Joshua Wheeler. It's a series of essays about New Mexico and it talks about the, a lot of it is about the nuclear program in New Mexico. And fun fact, did you know, the country that has had the most nuclear bombs dropped on it, it's America. Of course. Yeah. With the testing. Not even close. Yeah. It's right. Perfectly safe. Perfectly safe, perfectly fine. Just, just throw tell some them sunglasses. to throw some sunglasses on. Tell them aliens are doing it. <laughs> uh, I also, I mean, it turns into a really different kind of movie, but uh, Hiroshima Manamora, I think it's called. The first 10, 15 minutes of that, the depiction of the bomb on Hiroshima. I think actually specifically too because it's an old movie so it's so low tech but it's 
it's absolutely hard. It's almost like seems like it would be more accurate because it isn't like a big, you know, like CGI, like yeah. like it's really like the one in Terminator this, Two like, terrified me. I didn't remember that one. That actually, yeah. Word. There's this. The last tangent I'll get on. Is this the one in Terminator 2? Yeah, we won't play audio. Just uh, to, Jesus fucking Christ. I remember seeing this when I was a kid. And uh, yeah. This, I think, was in the Adam Curtis. Uh, this is definitely Adam Curtis B roll for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's this uh, French last tangent, this French philosopher whose name I'm forgetting actually. His whole argument is that we should be talking about these things regularly and enacting them in our imaginations so as to like you repress them because they're so terrifying and then that feeds the actual problem because it's not in your it's like oh, I don't want to think about it and then you know occasionally it just pops up in the news like oh we still haven't done anything about climate oh the Trump administration is tearing up one of the bu basic building blocks of proliferation control. And his idea is that you that those actual cultural acts are actually really important because they they bring it to the surface. Like you should be kind of scared, and then there should be an action that arises from that. It's interesting. Um, I, but you know, it's a balance. I was just reading an interview with Cornell West actually, and somebody was like you know, like some people don't want to tune in to like the fascism of the Trump administration because it's like it gets overwhelming and depressing. And by the way, I do think plenty of people should absolutely get offline and get outside and do other things for sure. And then uh, please do that. But then on the other hand, what Cornell West was saying is like, not in terms of he wasn't talking about following the news. He was talking about kind of like absorbing the full weight of what's going on, like kidnapping and, and, and uh, you know, putting ki children in concentration camps and human beings in concentration camps, which is literally what's happening. Um, that, you know, I mean, he uses really spiritual language, which I'm comfortable with, but because I do think it is like it, it requires a lot of human depth to work with. And there is a certain obligation to it because it's happening. Yeah, and people, I mean, it might be easy to be dismissive of the importance of representing this stuff on screen, but I also remember, I think it's, is it Remy Malik who's doing a Bond villain, and it's like an eco guy, eco terrorist or something like that. We and don't it's need like, that right now. Well, Alex, Alex Preen pointed out, like, like the... like the writers almost seem like if you, it was just a fossil fuel billionaire that's almost too easy or something like that. There was an old Bond one that had, that one of the new Daniel Craig ones was about this, like some, part of it was a company like stealing water in Bolivia. It was like, it's like good. That's perfect. And good that's politics. why, um, sorry to bother you was so good. Cause the way it kept escalating was like, it's turning people into like laboring half human, half horse hybrids. Right. And like that is actually, even though it's ludicrous and a reduction, a reductio ad absurdum, as Ben Burgess would say, um, it's it illustrates uh, something that's real and how like basically we are all conditioned by these corporations to be better workers. Um, so anyway, no, hundred uh, percent. Become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how this show happens, and this show is also brought to you by. Norton 360. When you shop, bank, or browse online, your personal information gets out there. Thankfully, Norton 360 with LifeLock is an all-in-one membership for cybersecurity. Now, no one can prevent all cybercrime and identity theft. But Norton 360 with LifeLock is a powerful ally to help protect you in today's connected world. Sign up today for Norton 360 with LifeLock membership. And as our listener, you'll save 25% or more off of your first year at norton.com slash majority. That's norton.com slash majority for 25% off. On last Tuesday's The Michael Brooks Show, we had a really, these shows are humming. The indispensable Adolph Reed Jr. Everybody order class notes. We talked about essentialism, the professional managerial class, and just got you know his really deep insight. 
the great Abby Martin joined us. We talked about Gaza. We talked about why Trump is empire. Don't believe all the nonsense about him being some type of quasi-isolationist. Civilian casualties across the globe have skyrocketed under the Trump administration. And the structural problems in Tulsi Gabbard's foreign policy thinking, then there was a parallel conversation. What are the similarities between the Elizabeth Warren 2020 campaign and the Bill Clinton 1992 campaign? We did some history. Uh, and, you know, honestly, when we get to the post game, talking about everything from Maradona to Bolivia with Nando Vila, I try to keep these short, but we, Matt, we cover like a hell of a lot on TMBS. And now we're doing these six o'clock pre streams on uh, where we talked about the last one. We gave you a 30 minute primer on what's happening in Haiti right now, which is another like unbelievably important story that not enough people are talking about then of course the post games and sunday shows so there's a huge amount of content interviews in the coming weeks include nina turner will re- um well i don't know when we're going to release it but slavoj zizek is behind a paywall next tuesday richard or excuse me we're doing next monday instead of tuesday shahid Buttar is going to be in studio and who's running as nancy pelosi we all better be supporting him and the great Richard Wolf returns. And the way it all happens is by you becoming a patron, patreon.com slash TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS, and go to the Michael Brooks Show on YouTube and click subscribe. Grab your tickets. We have only a couple of dozen left, uh, I think, maybe even just a dozen, for World Cafe, November 23rd, TMBS live show with Emma Viglin, Crystal Ball, Artesia Balthrop. Matt. Uh, yeah, folks, check out Literary Hangover. It's on YouTube or on podcast feeds. I just did an episode on the socio-political, uh, economic, all that stuff, uh, background of the Salem Witch Trials. And uh, we're going to be doing an Afro Ben uh, episode coming up soon. She was a playwright during the Restoration Period of England and also a spy, so psyops and the theater. Oh, and, I like uh, it. Yeah, so. That sounds very cool. Did you hear my impression when I did uh, the plug for your show on Tuesday? Uh, I did not. No, I should I go back and listen to it. It was actually pretty well received. I imagine. I imagine, and, and, I, and I still managed, I think, to give a more aggressive plug than you usually do. I'm a soft seller. You are definitely a soft seller. I think there's a, I think there's a third way in plugs. If um, you want it, you can have it. If you don't, just, <laughs> find, a, just find a podcast that makes you happy. <laughs> well, I'm Bill Clinton. Yeah, I was gonna say what I like. No, I thought it was more like, if you like your podcast, you can keep your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the John Osso from yeah. Selling Podcast. Uh, if you like your po- if you like your Patreon subs, you can keep them. All right, folks. See you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? Who, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back. 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 Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back. I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner for song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, fuck your mind up. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are... Psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Almost says what? What 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 Have you?
have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black Africans. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. See Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? 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 Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. It always gets me. Welcome to the fun half, everybody. Lots to get to. Start with a few calls. You're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello. Is this me? This is you. Hi. Hi. This is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Thank you for calling. I've missed talking You're to you. You're welcome. Well, you have my number, so. Fair enough. Um, behind the third so, wall uh, there. Everyone is asking what I think about Bernie's immigration plan. Yes, actually. Uh, everyone, on, everyone on Twitter is asking me about it. So what do you I think? thought I would call you and give you some thoughts. I love it. And I also like that I get an earnest call um, in contrast to the other calls. All right. <laughs> What do you think? Right, exactly. What, what, well, what, let's actually, can yeah. we do it real Sunday morning show like? What great, right, let me clear Chris Matthews. Like, what grade are you get? You're an immigration attorney. You do immigration. You're, you're a lawyer for, for immigrants. What grade are you giving this? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can do this, but um, it's a total A. Plus. I mean, look, he's coming <laughs> at it from a serious point of view, and uh, I don't know. I can't carry that on, but. Okay, um, no, it's fine. No, it's seriously, for, tell us. Yeah. Yeah, so um, for people, I, I guess some people have been asking because I've been a little bit. Um, a little bit of a fence sitter, a little cucky so yep. far on the, uh, Most the primary, uh, if you will. Most deaf. I'm uh, glad con- that you con- said it, so I didn't have to. Yep. Right. Uh, yep. A little cucky. Yep. Um, so. I think part of it is, you know, lots of people have it bad and lots of people have it bad under any kind of administration, including immigrants. But uh, on the day of the inauguration, there was a real switch that was flipped. And and when you're meeting with immigrants all day long, you, you see it yep. uh, becomes a obviously a major issue. And um, I think I'm a little bit or I have been parallel uh, paralyzed by the, the electability issue, uh, which I know we're not supposed to talk about, but we do all the time anyways. <laughs> I, and, I have never said we shouldn't talk about that, just just for the record, because just, it's just like, for the record. I lo- well, I just, I do like when we make like, we probably shouldn't talk about the vast bulk of general political commentary how, that will happen in the next 18 months. Like, yeah. it's right. going to happen. Yeah. Remember how we didn't want to talk about burn your bus stuff, and then we ended up talking about it for basically all of 2016? Yes. So, yes. yeah, that doesn't really work out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, but not feeling, I wasn't feeling real strong one way or the other. I think there's arguments, you know, on both sides of that. But, uh, Anyhow, so I kind of decided I, I needed to see Bernie's immigration plan. And, and you tweeted something like, if you're surprised by this, you're a fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> and, Thank you for sketching uh, my subtext. <laughs> that is exactly and, what uh, I was intending to say. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Hashtag subtweet. The, the issue is not that, uh, I, I, like for me at least, I'm not at all surprised. I think one of the concerns for um advocates and and immigrants is that it's the type of issue that could easily be uh, left on the back burner. Even if, even with a progressive uh, president, you know, it takes political capital to, to make moves on immigration and, and maybe some of the Trump stuff is uh, it's not 
uh, dramatically, um, it's not made worse, but it's just sort of left there. So that was kind of one of the concerns. But the plan right. that he came out with today uh, is really good. And um, there's some things in there that I'd never even really thought about or heard of. Like um, he, he proposes a whistleblower visa for immigrants who uh, report uh, workplace uh, mistreatment, which is a really good idea similar to a visa that exists for victims of crimes uh, who, who report the crimes to the police. And I, I love the idea of extending that to the workplace uh, and, um, you know, to a certain extent. Anyways, there's, there's similar things that exist, but it's, it's a really good idea. And then some of the things I gave Warren a lot of credit for, like coming out um, in favor of uh, getting rid of certain criminal penalties which is not a popular idea amongst a lot of uh, sort of establishment Democrats. If, if anything, most Democrats are sort of like, uh, we want an amnesty, but you're disqualified if you've ever had a DUI. Uh, they're right. just sort of open which to those, horrifying. those horrifying. sorts of things. Right, which is horrible. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so Bernie's plan gets into to that, into reversing uh, a lot of the bad things in the 1996 immigration reform. It's uh, it's long. It's this, it's very specific. Uh, so now he's the technocrat. Um, There's also uh, a time print. No, well, well, let me no. just let me just say, can I? Do you have a few minutes? Because I actually do want to go over a few things with you. Do you have a few minutes? Yeah, I'd love sure. to be able to talk about this actually a little bit more with you on the phone. So I get the snark about the technocratic point. I'm just going to make a really small point about that, but then I want to get to the more important stuff. The critique of people mm-hmm. like me is that you don't it's all make believe to just lead with plans that are never just going to be implemented until you show what your strategy for implementing those plans are. So my critique was like, yes, literally anybody could sit in a room with smart people and write up cool plans. But if you don't have a context in which those plans fit, it's pretty empty. And that was my critique, not plans per se. So I always assumed like, Bernie's going to assemble a campaign. Hopefully he's going to generate a lot of momentum. And then he's going to start unveiling these plans in a systemic way that actually fit with a big context for what you're doing in terms of like a broader campaign and a strategy. So that was my critique, not plans per se. But beyond that, I mean, I think that what you're seeing and I... So let me start with this, like a broader question about immigration. It seems to me that part of what I think people got confused about with Bernie heading in this direction was, I mean, one is like the legitimate stuff that you pointed to, which is these are, you know, a group of people that are demonized and marginalized. And therefore it's, you know, it's, it can be in a certain sense, politically easier to put on the back burner. That's I, I, by the way, I think it's a valid concern with anybody running for president, frankly. Um, but there, then there's this, like, I'm trying to distinguish, right? Okay. We have a Republican party that embraces full on strategic white supremacy, because I don't think it's just, I think for some people it's a genuine bigotry. I think for other people, it's just, we want to keep a white electorate. Right. Then I think Mm -hmm. there's the kind of broader truth, which is like, Americans rated Obama as being ultra left wing on immigration, which he was most decidedly not. Then there's actually a fair amount of polling coming from people like Stan Greenberg, which actually showed that like pretty much everybody outside of the Republican Party has pretty uh, liberal views on immigration when they're actually asked specifically about it, I think especially coming out of the midterms. And then there's this third other discursive problem, which kind of becomes like, you know, maximalist demands around things like open borders, which you could either see as like a multi-decade long vision into the future, or you could even say, maybe I don't actually support open borders. I just want like humane and internationally like, you know, law observable, decent ones, but countries can still like have their sovereignty, right? Like I'm, I'm less invested in that argument. And I think what happened is that Sanders kind of got sandwiched in some ways in between like, cause I think some of the false expectation set was because he didn't just like, you know, 
throw a bunch of discourse out when it was to me it was like obvious that of course he's going to have a plan and of course it's going to be the most left-wing plan because he's the most left-wing guy like he generally cares about this stuff this is why there's a domestic workers bill of rights is implemented in the bill the whistleblower protection the there's a five-year plan for legal residency whereas the warren plan doesn't actually have a timeline on it i mean you know that sort of thing does yeah, that make I haven't sense i had a chance to um sit yeah. down and like uh carefully compare them side by side I, I think they're both really good and his is probably uh better and yeah i mean again i i don't think anybody was like well uh you know obviously hillary said that uh you know, he voted against the last comprehensive immigration reform and vote or the not the last one, but the one before that. The one of the Kennedy Bush era. Bill. Yeah. And he and he voted for the, the 96 reforms that he's now in favor of, of repealing, which I, I, I honestly don't hold that against him. Um, but I, I think some people did have some concerns that, like, you know, maybe it's just not a top priority for him. And and part of the evidence of that was that, you know, he ran before and he's been running for a while and his website had basically like four bullet points and it was like reinstate DACA and, and not be a racist. And which to be fair is what they all are saying, right? Like this is the only one that actually formally breaks up ice and CPP, not as a slogan, but actually does it. Yeah. And and, And to be clear, like, if he just had those four bullet points, it's not that I would think, oh, well, he's actually Trump in wolf's clothing. And in fact, I would I would fully understand the sort of like political strategy to, uh, you know, why take a risk on, on this issue that maybe isn't at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. So, so like, in other words, it, it it's not something I was ready to like necessarily hold against him but I, I just wanted to see his plan and he does have around him i think uh really good people and people who had you know advised him on this and uh and it's it's really good and it's bold and it's um innovative i think too so um what do you I'm think i'm gonna throw a little yeah go ahead when you think about messaging this stuff and persuading people on it i mean does that kind of at least from the perspective of this show, that there is that there is a nativist xenophobic force in this country, then there's actually probably a relatively broad swath of people that uh, actually have pretty decent views on this stuff. Then there maybe there's another group of people that uh, have uh, actual labor concerns, which they're misassigning the blame essentially. So maybe they could be, you know, and I think this, this actually, this way that Sanders is approaching it is helpful in that regard um, in terms of putting mm-hmm. the, the pressure on the employer um, and, you know, putting the, the targets right in terms of the analysis. And then like a kind of another, you know, people, a group of people who might be, you know, speaking in some, at times in like some super laudable utopian terms, but sometimes like maybe, you know, that isn't where the kind of like political culture is at yet. Right. And so you're navigating in between these kind of currents as a Democrat. What do you think like is the best way in a general election for them to talk about it in a way that is actually like really offensive and, you know, in terms of going on offense and you think kind of effective right. for persuading people? Uh, well, I think, uh, first of all, I kind of agree. I agree with you on open borders as a, as a framing. Uh, I remember when I first heard that term and like, I don't know that I still am able to totally conceptualize it, which is, a, which is the problem with the idea is that for most people, um, it, it's beyond really what they're able to, even imagine right and so it's sort of a non-starter for for most people um and maybe it's like the kind of conversation you want to have in in a college classroom and and you can where you have time to like imagine utopian futures and things like that i'm not saying it's a bad idea i'm just saying i don't know that it's useful for uh, politically obviously it's useful to be in the the greenhouse but it's not going to be something that you're going to say on the stump right like Right. So yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think 
the best way, and I guess I've said this on the show before, but in terms of framing, I would say something like, you know, people say immigrants need to get in line. Um, and I agree. The problem is there is no line. We're going to give them that line. Mm. Or, uh, you know, people say immigrants need to do it the right way. The problem is there is no right way and we're going to give them, a, give them the right way. And we think that, you know, essentially what his plan says is, you know, if you've been here five years and you're a person of good moral character and you pass but we want to legalize your status. Right. And that's, that's an idea that exists in, a, in the minds of a lot of critics, but not in reality. So right. I think that's how I would, how I would start. And keep, Can you explain that simple. when you say exists in the minds of a lot of critics, but not reality? Do you mean that I'm, I'm not trying to take too much of your time. It is interesting that like people who might say we need to get hard on the border. We need to da 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 da. And then you said to them, and then you said, well, how do you think it works now? They say, well, well, I mean, obviously, if somebody's been here for a while and, you know, they uh, own a little business by me or something, I'm sure they can just like go to the post office or something and get citizenship. Like, <laughs> is that true that some some people I mean, there's obviously really vindictive, evil, racist, xenophobic people, but there might actually be some people who discursively sound really hard line and then you actually ask them policy sets they might even be shocked that we don't already have a system like what sanders is proposing yeah i hear that all the time and you see it all the time when there's a story about somebody like with daca in the comments there's always people saying oh she's been here 20 years and hasn't even applied for her citizenship yet like that's some sort of own right and what they don't realize is like you know that's not a thing that's the reason why daca exists and so um, now a, a lot of those people I've I've uh, like my racist Facebook uncle, I've held his hand through it. And, you know, and he'll circle back to say, well, if they love this country, they would they would apply. And so for some of those people, it's yeah, we'll ask him. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think for a lot of other people, they would be surprised to find out. Uh, how stupid the and unfair the system is because people have a general sense of like, well, there's something that exists and it's kind of fair and it kind of makes sense. And when I get done with the consultation, it, I almost always say like all of this, what I'll tell the potential client is all of this is stupid. I know. And they kind of look at me like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Like, uh, not, nothing makes sense. It's a bizarro world, and, uh, yeah. See, yeah, I mean, I don't know how so, uh, relatable this is, but, like, my family has a sort of family legends about Ellis Island that they, yep. like, love to tell. And people, just I think, just assume right. it still works like that. Like, if we did, it, it oh, was yeah. basically like a, a quick sightseeing thing around Manhattan, then you go to the Heartland somewhere. Although the funniest, I, I always remember that scene in The Sopranos where they're upstate, and they start telling stories about how their grandparents came over because they're still like pretty Italian on that show. And one guy is like, yeah, like I think it was actually his dad. He was just like, yeah, dad actually, you know, he came like literally was like smuggling something from Canada and then just like stayed and became like a hitman for like the New Jersey mob and, you know, never got his paperwork probably because he never wanted to pay, you know, even have to like pretend to pay taxes. And they're all just kind of chuckling and like reflecting on the good old days. And then one of them is just like, tell you what, you got to seal that border up now, though. <laughs> 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 like, like it's a really serious like, no, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> I think right. that, that kind of distills everything right there. Yeah, that's about right, I think. So anyways, I'm going to uh, throw some money to Bernie. I hope he does well in the first few states. And Awesome. Everybody listen to the uh, redirect uh, immigration law and perspectives. It's a, I'm a patron. It's a fantastic podcast. And uh, he's also, I, we did a great I, deep no, dive no, no. on ice once on my show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for taking my call. You guys and uh, love you both or whoever's in there. Love <laughs> all of you. And uh, yeah, love you back. Love Ronald love you too, Reagan. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Is the best if you if you do want a podcast on this issue, you can't do better seriously than the redirect. You'll really learn. Like, there's a it, lot it of makes mechanics me better at my learn. job. Yeah, there's a lot of mechanics to learn in this stuff. Like, I mean, obviously, there's broad strokes, you know. But if you want to get into details, that's the that's the yeah, definitely. You're calling from a nine one seven area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? 
Oh, hey, good afternoon, Michael and company. This is Waterboat from Kashmir. Waterboat from Kashmir. How are you today? Thanks for calling. I'm well, and thank you. It was a great interview. First of all, thank you for doing it. I was actually not going to call in at all because mm-hmm. you guys, you know, you did a whole interview about Kashmir. But I was looking at the chat, and I was like, what the fudge? Oh, don't do that. So I figured... <laughs> Bad <laughs> idea. Bad practice. Uh, no, normally you know, I see trolls and stuff, but then sometimes you know things actually get kind of weird. Um, well, no, first of all, great interview. Um, but just wanted to point out um, uh, because it's, it's such a packed subject, so there's so much. Um, in fact, historically, most Kashmiris, and I think even today, as uh, Professor Jude pointed out, um, are, you know do want uh, independence. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it was in the 1980s because of the Indian brutality that more and more Kashmiris wanted to be part of Pakistan. It kind of had this weird effect. You know, kind of the way where, uh, was it, uh, Nikki Haley, uh, when she was in, um, talking in uh, the UN, they're like, you know, they, they put swastikas on, uh, on kites and send them over. Right. And they're like, why do you do this? Like, oh, it makes the Jews mad, <laughs> as in the Israelis. It was kind of that effect took on. And it just, you know, uh, snowball from there. But uh, the people are saying that there are protests happening on the Pakistani side of Kashmir. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, they are. Mm-hmm. But we should really be careful when we highlight these things. One of the reasons why I think everyone's not been highlighting that is because those guys, they want to cross the border. I mean, not the border, the LOC. And because they're like, you know, Kashmiris are dying in the, under the Indian control. So, yeah, most Kashmiris want independence. I think that is true. Um, But what's happening on the Pakistani side right now is kind of silly as well, because the government, there is a clampdown. But those people want to go to the border. You know, not not armed. They're like, we're just going to go there. They're going to kill us. It's going to start a war. So those guys are kind of insane. We don't want a war, because I think that's what you guys ended this uh, whole thing on. I I caught the tail end because the signals were horrible. Uh, but I think you had, I, I, I don't know who you had last week, who was um, about Kashmir. They're talking about, like, a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, like around 100 kilotons. Yep. Uh, Daniel Besser. Between the two countries. Yeah, Daniel Besser. That's right. Uh, between the two countries, they have several hundred uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and the thing is, they have what we call uh, nuclear weapons, meaning they're uh, tactical nuclear warheads, meaning you're more likely to use them. Uh, this was the whole deal with when, um, uh, when Trump was like, you know, we're going to make smaller nukes. And it was like, no, no, this is a horrible idea. Right. Because if you don't need to use city killers to use it in a war right. if you are uh, under threat. And the problem is any nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, if it were to happen, uh, would happen in what we call Punjab, which literally means five rivers. It is the most fertile place yep. on the planet. And when you guys had uh, Daniel Ellsberg, remember he talked about yep. limited nuclear exchange in um, yep. the Ukraine would, you know, basically bring down nuclear, uh, sorry, uh, uh, what's it, food production in the world. Right. This would kill humanity. It's not just the area that gets irradiated. It's all the stuff. It's not just like a forest fire. Right. These fires, they burn hot. There's a lot of kind of power. This is horrible. So I just wanted to point out silly people, uh, Please, let's not end humanity. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but by the way, great interview, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for the recommendation of uh, Professor of, of uh, Janad. He was a great guest. I really appreciate it. Take oh, you're care. welcome. Have a nice day, guys. You too. Bye-bye. Yes. Um, we follow the tips, folks. Actually, let me just read. I want to just read a little bit. We'll get to the story in a second. But um, just to be clear. Bernie Sanders has put out by far the most comprehensive plan on immigration. Now, I yes, I did think it was obvious that it was coming. I had no other reason to think otherwise. The thing that you can trust about Bernie Sanders is that if there there's certain areas that there wasn't a lane on that he was like for decades I'm going to be the only guy talking about corporate concentrations of wealth and agri- and power and agriculture and media and I'm going to say everybody deserves health care and I'm going to talk about wealth inequality right and maybe I'm not going to be able to shoulder the weight of every single marginalized left idea for decades 
So I'm going to pick and choose my battles. Uh, and I might have even cast some bad votes uh, somewhere along the way, like literally anybody who's ever held office has. But what you can be extremely confident of is if, and this is why I'm sorry, I mean, the guy really is a remarkable figure. If he has an opportunity to go left, almost always, almost always, not always, but almost always, he's going to go there. And the context uh, was being created there on immigration, which again, he wasn't, you know, sort of claims of his right position of it were always, you know, obviously sort of, you know, mind-blowingly exaggerated. But this is really important. I'm going to quote now from Ida Chavez in The Intercept. The plan goes beyond a general call to a path for legal status and immigrants and takes full aim at President Donald Trump's racist policies at the southern border. Unlike any other Democrat, Sanders calls for the breakup of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Service and the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and improving working and labor conditions for industries that rely on an immigrant workforce. One piece of this is a domestic worker bills of rights, which would provide domestic workers with at least a $15 minimum wage, strong protection for collective bargaining rights, workers' uh, workplace safety, and fair scheduling regardless of immigration status. Notably, this goes beyond further. Notably, this goes further than even his progressive fellow progressive hopeful Senator Elizabeth Warren calling for a full demilitarization of the border. Now, this is the point I've always made. I don't support open borders in current politics. I absolutely don't. And not only, I mean, it's a, it's not a real political plan and strategy in a U.S. context right now, and it's profoundly problematic. Like if you go and you watch President Lula's interviews about Brazil, he talks all the time about restoring Brazilian sovereignty. Or if you go to First Nations people in Canada, I don't agree with that frame at all in a present context. But demilitarization, the idea that, yes, somebody can come to your border, apply for asylum, go through a process. They're not going to be terrorized in a military way, um, which has been the case for decades and decades, certainly at the very least going back to the 96 legislation accelerated under Bush, formalized under Obama, and brought to a whole other phase of terrorism by this administration. Bernie Sanders is doing that. So, And then it goes on to talk about uh, how there are specific timelines and, and other incredibly important things. And you're, you're seeing a real pattern here, which again is, is distinct in this campaign. Bernie Sanders is saying, let's legalize marijuana. Let's legalize, legalize weed, cannabis. We need to do it. Everybody knows that, right? But are we going to do it in such a way? It, there's a freedom dimension. There's a justice dimension. That's why his plan has legalization. But then it says we're going to expunge everybody's records, which not everybody says they would do. Then it says we're going to have anti-monopoly practices put in so weed doesn't become the next big tobacco. And then finally, we know that the drug war is fundamentally racist and fundamentally classist and targets specific communities. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a package of, I think, $20 billion as restitution to those communities and actually specifically try to generate small business out of the communities that have been most victimized by the drug war. You see this with immigration. We're going to do all of the things that everybody knows we need to do that are just basic bare minimum humanity in terms of DACA and path to citizenship and so on. But then we're going to th start thinking systemically. And it's funny because on one hand, which is kind of depressing, as somebody pointed out a lot, and this is also why it isn't, you know, in some ways it's been, I think, not necessarily politically effective to frame, like abolishing ICE is not a radical proposition at all. This is literally just saying, let's go back to the year 2000 when there was still plenty of problems. But that's a much smarter uh, frame for speaking to a broad set of people about this. What is new that he's putting on the table, which will also be both absolutely necessary policy-wise and politically advantageous, is making a labor issue. And when you start to integrate that as a labor issue, then you can also go to the uh, people who might have a, you know, a, a misperception uh, because again, if you dig into all of the studies, it's not, it's not immigrate. I mean, look, immig immigration can absolutely be deployed as a force by capital under cut rages. That's basic economics. That's reality. But the problem is capital. What this does is it says we're going to not only have a path of justice 
on this, but we're also going to have a labor path. Again, it's just, it's not only the most left wing, it's a broader set of thinking. And if you've been following this campaign and seeing where things are going, yeah, shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, Solidarity with Glenn Greenwald. So Glenn Greenwald, uh, you know, whatever. I, I, I think the whole Greenwald debate is frankly excruciatingly boring at this point. Bottom line is, one of the nice things about Glenn is that you can profoundly and vehemently disagree with him and he welcomes that and I think probably actually enjoys that more than the normal person. Uh, he will go in any media outlet that will have him. Uh, he, uh, you know, you can agree with his positions on various things. I will say with uh, his beliefs around things like Silicon Valley and uh, uh, putting, uh, you know, faith in, in tech monopolies in terms of broader questions about uh, political, uh, you know, about journalism and speech. I agree with him. I don't think that's the way to go. I think we need nationalization and government regulation. I don't think we need to uh, appeal to the higher nature of these platforms. And this is all in the context of that. With the Lava Jato leaks, Glenn Greenwald is now at the epicenter of basically two of the most important stories that have happened in modern politics. The Snowden revelations and the Lava Jato leaks showing that this process, this legal team that was globally lauded, made Lula da Silva a political prisoner and was a right-wing hack operation and new revelations show them doing the same thing to the ex-Peruvian president. And on top of all of it, and again, you can disagree with Glenn Greenwald, as I do on certain things, he is literally in Brazil getting serious death threats. This guy, his name and his husband's name were found on the persons on a list of the same people that assassinated Marielle Franco. So this is real shit. This is not just Twitter bickering. He's at risk of political murder. He is at risk of political murder. And not only there, going on every outlet. So I actually saw him tweeting about this, as he's wont to do. Yesterday, he was on a Communist Party outlet in uh, Brazil. And today, he said he was going on a pro-Bolsonaro uh, far-right outlet. And again, I don't think that... I'm sorry. I don't think Glenn is a Trump sympathizer. I... I'm not going to keep stipulating. I have disagreements with him. He's not a Trump symbolizer, sympathizer. That's a total bullshit argument. Uh, and as with regards to Bolsonaro, probably nobody has done more than the inter Look, read Brazil Wire. Brazil Wire has been on it from the beginning. They're incredible. And I disagree with some Glenn. I, I'll say again, I disagree with Glenn on some of the things about Brazil. But nobody has probably done more to destabilize the Bolsonaro government than the Intercept's reporting. He's And so he's going on a Bolsonaro network to debate because that's what he does at literal physical risk. So I hope people will grow up about Glenn Greenwald. And uh, he got, in fact, physically assaulted today. So we'll play that. It wasn't a tremendous fight. Glenn gets right up there, right? In his Glenn has there. Glenn is fearless. Glenn is fearless, man. When he when those revelations first dropped on Lava Jato and Bolsonaro's idiot party, the first thing they did was they were like, he needs to come to the Congress right now. And then they realized, wait a second, well, he'll probably just make us look bad. Glenn was in the back of a car on his phone, literally in Portuguese, being like, I'm here. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. You got to admire the hell out of Glenn Greenwald. You got to keep your eye on the bigger picture. This guy is fucking fearless and at the epicenter of the two most. I mean, I, I think we do really valuable work. I have confidence in what we do, and I think we contribute. I don't bank on doing one of those stories that this guy has done in his career. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without yeah. journalists doing what Glenn Greenwald does repeatedly. Precisely. So stop being petty. Think big picture. Solidarity with Glenn Greenwald. 1,000%. It always should have been the case, but this really underlines it. Let's play this clip. Voltar para seu abrigo. Okay, so he just wrote 
the support of the Bolsonaro's government to use violence in politics. Violence in debate is the fascist mindset and very dangerous for democracy. And that's Augusto Nunes was the uh was the fascist who assaulted Glenn Greenwald. Yeah, a columnist it looks like. Columnist, yeah. Some disgusting bloated baby. Glenn Greenwald is fearless. Respect. Um Where did I put my sound sheet? Did I get a sound sheet? No, I'm just I got it. Um Dan Crenshaw. He's a tough guy, right? He's got an eye patch. We all know he's a super tough guy. He fought for our freedoms like the he First fought, Amendment. He fought for our freedoms like the First Amendment. He never tied. And somehow this guy can fit his military service into, I don't know, explaining why he shouldn't get paid a minimum wage or whatever. Um, I guess he did actually go into the military, but he just reeks of cosplay to me. And uh, check out his Facebook groups. Yeah, Facebook Administrator Dan Crenshaw. Check out Facebook Administrator Dan Crenshaw. But look, he doesn't like the snowflake culture. He went overseas to fight for our freedom. He's going to support the First Amendment in all scenarios, right? Yes, sir. Uh, my question is for Congressman Crenshaw. I, first of all, I want to thank you for your distinguished service to this country. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, just this year after a 2017 version of the law was blocked by a federal judge, Texas passed a law that still requires certain contractors to sign a pledge that they will not boycott Israel. The state of Florida has also passed a law outlawing the mere criticism of Israel. Representative Crenshaw, on May 9th of this year, similar legislation was even attempted at the federal level when the House Appropriations Committee sought to amend a routine government funding bill to allow federal agencies to compel contractors to promise not to boycott Israel as a requirement of maintaining their relationship with the U.S. government. Congressman, in spite of our unique and historic alliance, these laws are obvious, flagrant, and troubling violations of the First Amendment and free speech. Given that when you entered office, you swore to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, my question is this, will you honor your oath and denounce these laws here, now, and forever, or do you agree with Governor DeSantis and Governor Abbott that the First Amendment should only apply to Americans who support Israel? Yeah, that's impeccable. You're advocating for the First Amendment, or at least you're cloaking yourself in the First Amendment. I wouldn't presume my intentions. I, I wouldn't presume my intentions. I will. Because I know who you guys are. And here's the problem with the BDS movement. When, when you create a movement, I'm not advocating for the BDS and divest and sanction the one Jewish state just because they are the one Jewish state, there is a deep problem with that. That is anti Semitism manifest. It's your right as an American. This is, I mean, look, obviously we all know the ways in which, you know, this, uh, this guy's an absolutely dishonest scumbag, but. It is incredible. I mean, it's not incredible. It's expected. But yes, there is a pure First Amendment argument on this. And if you took the First Amendment seriously, which I think I might more than a fair amount of other people. I think we both do more than Dan Crenshaw does. I, absolutely. It, by the way, would apply to even uh, obscene anti-Semitism uh, in terms of speech. It would. Now, I think uh, obviously... When it comes to things like employment, stuff like that, of course, that's a different matter. But the second bigger point, and I think this lie that, you know, it's not just Dan Crenshaw, a ton of Democrats still repeat this, is becoming increasingly untenable. The state of Israel is not boycotted by people. I mean, look, sure, there's some, there's obviously there's anti Semitism. The vast majority of people in the United States involved in this movement are because they oppose apartheid. And they oppose uh, snipers uh, shooting unarmed protesters, nonviolently demonstrating in Gaza. This situation is observable and apparent to anybody. And if there is going to be no diplomatic pressure and no political pressure, what you do is you do other forms of pressure, just like against apartheid South Africa. So 
Dan Crenshaw's stupidity, dishonesty, and cynicism is expected. But you should look at the dishonesty, stupidity, uh, and 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 uh, of this and cynicism of this answer, and ask yourself, how is this different from anything that Nancy Pelosi would say? And we didn't pull it; I forgot to add it. But Congressman Andy Levin, who's a you know good, uh, solid, I think relatively moderate congressman, who I'm going to assume he's from Michigan. He probably has a fair amount of Muslims in his district, or he might not have done this. Uh, and he's of Jewish descent, I believe, just got back from a trip to the West Bank and was like, I mean, this is disgusting. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He put it much more diplomatically. But, and by the way, that is the West Bank. The West Bank is like the Jim Crow situation, the wall situation, the separate roads, the lack of freedom of movement. Gaza is a full administered prison which the conditions are so vindictive and abusive that i have no doubt and other people have said this that the plan at some point is to just add, it'd be like look you want to go to a place where the employment rate isn't over 50 percent we limit you know there isn't electricity people are dying from heat that we, we limit water medicine rebuilding materials we we bomb it kill a massive amount of civilians every couple of months do you want to just take a cash transfer and self-deport yourself so we can go back and reclaim it as part of a greater Israel project? I have no doubt. So, uh, you know, Crenshaw, and look, and by the way, I mean, look, I mean, it's pretty obvious why I would mention this. She would never, ever uh, say any of this in the same way. But, you know, a lot of people, including Ayanna Presley, voted Rokana. They voted to block people's freedom of speech, to exercise their right to engage in boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And the, it's a right. This is, uh, I've played this on my show. Um, and this is Nelson Mandela. This was one of his first interviews in the United States. It was at a town hall in Harlem with Ted Koppel. Here he is talking about, you know, a lot of a lot of people who seem to know nothing about either place discount the analogies. Let's look at Nelson Mandela, who liberated South Africa. What did he think of the comparison? We identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. Wow. I, had, I actually thought that what Mandela said is, but when you single Israel out for criticism. But not about this economic <laughs> warfare that is manifest anti-Semitism. <laughs> it is anti-Semitism. You should do BDS for South Africa. But if you do that, don't forget when you see the slaughter of unarmed protesters in Gaza that there were people rolling garbage cans towards Israel. And those 10 year olds were hardened Hamas operatives as human shields. You're being deliberately misleading. You're being deliberately misleading. Next week, I will be on Bill Maher with Barry Weiss. <laughs> Apparently, college students can destroy free speech, but literal federal and state legislation to block a political exercise against a sovereign state, that's kosher. I guess. It's all in my new book. You're an anti-Semite and you threaten free speech. The Left Today by Nelson Mandela. Um, the so-called progressives are actually regressive. That is literally the, I think, outgoing prime minister of Israel, no doubt listening to his fail son son, <laughs> quoting Dave Rubin. Uh, that is a real drop of a real thing that that happened. is actually there's a above you know twenty five percent chance that that's the actual lineage of how BB got that. I have no doubt. Like, dad, 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 the the real the the progressives are really regressives. Okay, I understand, but maybe you could stop sharing Nazi memes on Facebook. That might be helpful, son. <laughs> Oh my God, what a disgusting mess. Uh, okay, let's do, which number is it? Oh, is it one? Yeah. All right, Donald Trump. I, 
I don't know. I actually think in some ways this kind of works uh, because another part of Donald Trump's kind of like reality TV populism, I think is honestly, what he also does is play to people's version of like, hey, if I was super rich, I would be an asshole. Here's Donald Trump. Americans worked hard, made a lot of money, much smarter. You know, they call them the elite. We're the elite. We're the elite. I know this. <laughs> I know this. Speaking for myself, I went to better schools than they did. I went to, I have nicer houses than they do. I have nicer apartments. I have nicer everything. <laughs> and they're elite. But we're not elite. You people work your asses off. You're making a lot of money. You're smarter than they are. You're smarter than they are. Antifa, you ever see Antifa? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. It's not a surprise to me that he beat Hillary Clinton. It's not a surprise at all. It, it's it's actually, I, I feel embarrassed every day that I believe those polls, that demographics would save the day at the end of that election. I did always think he'd win the Republican primary. But, um, you know, it reminds me of uh, this uh, Ayn Rand uh, story where, you know, because all of, you know, Ayn Rand's turgid and depressing and boring and embarrassing books basically all just say, like, look, if you're not, you know, some type of, uh, I don't know, some some type of, like, asshole oligarch, you know, you're a loser. And so... I read somewhere about him, you know, a really upset letter she got from some guy who, you know, I don't know what is, you know, he was like middle management or something. And he kind of said, you know, I love your books and I get it, but it's, you know, it's kind of devastating because I'm, you know, basically like I'm a parasite. Like he, you know, to his credit, he had enough reading comprehension to understand what she was saying. And, uh, which, you know, it's not hard to figure out. And she's basically wrote back to him like, oh, well, you know, if you and essentially like if you read this book and you get it, you're part of it. Like, don't worry. You are part of this elite cast. So Trump's uh, given a lot of very insecure people um, as well as a lot of like, you know, probably, you know, extremely overstuffed, self-satisfied used Chevrolet dealers. Uh, a lot of a lot of psychic payoff right there. Uh, this was disgusting. Uh, I, if you discount the idea of Jeffrey Epstein being uh, whacked, I'm not saying you have to believe it, whatever, but if you think that a guy who ran a global pedophile network who had close and ongoing relationships with heads of state, states in multiple countries, Wall Street, Almost certainly the intelligence community on some level, if we're being real. Yes. Uh, of course. Uh, that after. I mean, look at who Ghislaine's father is. Sir, I mean, look at Ghislaine's father. Look at what Acosta told the Trump transition team. Why did you give this guy such a light sentence? I was told he was intelligence and to lay off. That That is a, that's a quote, guys. That's one you can look up. In any any publication that is not from like World Zion Net Daily, okay, that's real. So he gets murdered in jail, or he dies in jail. He's in a hugely secured facility, and I know some people go to like, well, actually, you know, prisons are really understaffed and underinvested. Okay. I, I think you're telling yourself a little bit of a bedtime story. But at the very least, the fact is, is that the Clinton family, Bill Clinton in particular, but also Hillary Clinton, had a uh, strong enough relationship to go on, you know, Bill Clinton's case, multiple plane rides with Jeffrey Epstein. There's photos, there's, uh, you know, all sorts of, yeah. That cool painting in his uh, apartment. Of Bill in the blue dress. There's a cool painting of Bill in the blue dress. And, you know, okay, Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton now have a book out trying to, you know, capitalize on the, on the, uh, on the new trend. All this also, of course, on the heels of like, you know, basically Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, covering for Harvey Weinstein. 
And we have this relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. And I will say, I mean, Liz Franzik makes this point, and I'm, I do really like the True Non podcast, that the people who, like, dismissing the Epstein story and how it connects to people like the Clintons or George Mitchell or, you know, or Rich or Bill Richardson. I mean, you can look all this stuff up in terms of accusations and obviously, I mean, not just, you know, ugh, Dershowitz. But... um there is a huge class dimension to dismissing this because of course the vast majority of, of victims uh, were, you know, truly underclass across the globe. It's a disgusting, horrifying story. And so this kind of like, Oh, don't bother Hillary Clinton about it. She's a pioneer or something is, you know, it's stupid in and of itself, but it reveals such a priority set of who gets, you know, on the page or not. Now, Trevor Noah, I'll remind everybody, and we should have pulled this again. Uh, he did a bit in South Africa where he made fun of the, Mar he made light of the Maracana massacre where multiple striking miners were murdered for striking. And Trevor Noah thought it was a jolly good bit. And I don't mean like a, you know, it's so brutal, it's funny, and it reveals the truth bit. I mean, sort of like, what were they supposed to do? They were striking, sort of bit. I've never, I mean, I, you know, whatever. I know it triggers a lot of people. I've never really understood the appeal of Trevor Noah. I don't think he's particularly funny. I, I know I, I see the comments. We make fun of these Daily Show folks, and the people get extremely triggered by that. So I won't lay it on too thick, but I would say, look up the Maracana thing, and this joke and this exchange with Hillary Clinton on light of Jeffrey Epstein, in light of Jeffrey Epstein, is uh, disgusting. Hillary, I have to ask you a question that has been plaguing me for a while. How did you kill Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> <laughs> because you, you, you're not in power, but not you have power. all the power. <laughs> I, I really need to understand how you do what you do. <laughs> because you seem to be behind everything nefarious, and yet you do not use it to become president. <laughs> what is the game plan? <laughs> well, Trevor. What is, what, but honestly, actually, what does it feel like being... That is the only legitimate part of that question, actually. And I sort of mean that sincerely. It's not a bad burn. Yeah, like, you, you, you know, it is kind of true. There's so much dirt and not the conspiracy, like, whatever. Yes, there's lies about the Clinton family. There's also a lot of truth about the Clinton family. So we Why? call turd and punch bull, as it, Alex Jones called David Icke. Indeed. Why the hell does not that not translate to being able to, like, where does all this Machiavellian scheming turn into, like, you know what? We should just listen to this twerpy Robbie Moot kid. He's got a data model. Let's not campaign. Another good question he could have thrown in there uh, during his little spiel was uh, how did uh, his great friend Ghislaine get a aisle seat at uh, your wedding? Chelsea? Well, that's actually, we can just pause this here because yes. that, that is, it. let's think about some alternative bits for this segment. Yeah. Um, Cause one would have been like, Hey Chelsea, how about you detail uh, your relationship with Ghislaine Maxwell, who was who, like Brandon said, had a uh, aisle seat at your wedding. Ghislaine Maxwell, by the way, is, is, is very, is accused by procure. multiple victims as being Jeffrey Epstein's procurer. She was at a aisle seat in Chelsea Clinton's wedding. And another question for both of them. How how do you think that um, hundreds of girls that Jeffrey Epstein victimized and raped, not to say anything about, you know, what other what other people allegedly did with Epstein, but Epstein, we know he was a rapist of, you know, scores of young girls. Maybe the most prolific pedophile in history how do line. you think your husband slash father's uh um you know appearance on the flight logs with epstein and you know apparent uh, relationship with him public relationship to the point where there's a painting of bill um in epstein's uh you know like um apartments multi-million multi dollar like i think it's a 50 million dollar townhouse how do you think knowledge of uh, Bill's relationship with Epstein. What do you think effect that knowledge had on those victims? Do you think it made them less likely to maybe try to seek justice when they see something like that? I mean, it's disgusting. They, all, all three of these, and the worst thing is, is uh, what that writing room must have been like. Because it's like we—that's the worst thing. You know, yeah, yep. you know, we need to address it. 
Yep. Uh, Cause we're like the edgy satire thing. And how do you do it? You do it in the safest way possible that lets them sweep it all under the rug as if it's just like the, you know, the right wing propaganda. Machine exactly. Or whatever. Exactly. I mean, it's, and I mean, it's not a joke that Epstein uh, looks like he was whacked. I mean, I think he would, his, Death, whether it was murder or an arranged suicide, it was arranged by, you know, malevolent forces. I think it, that's pretty obvious at this point. And if I mean, that, even the latest uh, uh, assessment. But even if it was unlikely, but just a possibility, that possibility is looming over all these victims' heads that have been coming forward That's and, right. you know, speaking out against Epstein. That's right. So it's not a joke. Like, and, you know, we talk about you know, what things actually offend you. This is offensive. This right. is, this is absolutely offensive it's this is offensive joke yes look at that's us that's an actual declared, offensive joke this we is what an offensive joke looks like <laughs> and it's 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 disgusting and frankly horrifying and i i mean honestly it feels like message sending uh and both of the like both the clint all the clintons get the hell out of here i agree absolutely let's all right let's go uh wait is this bill or hrc in the clip eight i thought it was bill Oh, okay, great, great. great. All right, so when she's not laughing... She's bootlicker at the New York Times. Of course. Uh, yes, Andrew Ross, the, the ever-odious Andrew Ross Hawkins. So when Hillary Clinton is not, uh, uh, you know, la uh, yucking it up about uh, Jeffrey Epstein with uh, Trevor Noah, she is at the Deal Book Conference. Now, look, I don't think she's come surprise to anyone. I mean, Hillary Clinton is, you know, is a right-wing politician. We're going to be using any kind of appropriate terminology she uh, i mean look let's be real i mean not only is she a right-wing politician she is literally an intellectual pioneer of the corporate neoliberalization of democratic party politics uh even her sort of touchy-feely it takes a village book has so much poor blaming uh and and sort of homages to the small scale community nonsense in the face of corporate onslaught that she and her husband supported every hilt, uh, every step of the way. She supported all these trade agreements. She, uh, she represented wall street quite effectively in New York. This should come as a surprise to absolutely no one. We used to have a wealth tax. It was called. Whoa. Hold on one second. Hold on. Okay. Whoa. Take it down. Oh, no. Video unavailable. It just went private, so I guess we won't be doing that segment. What the hell? Shit. I got him. They got him. Got him. Got Hold him. on, Majority Dead. Report. Take do your Fuck you, Majority I mean, Report. We can't get all the stupid you things. You have said. been criticizing I, my wife for years. You know, I, I, <laughs> I was going to let you do that when I heard you talking about it in prep, but you went a little too deep on that Epstein <laughs> yeah. stuff. Okay, I thought I we were going to we're gonna do some impressions, maybe make some funny jokes. You okay, did. I got some things to do. I got a, I got a whole protest movement to put down with private militias in Haiti. You did. Keep the grain flowing. You need to drag the drop down to private. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's demonetized. I don't care if it's demonetized. Uh, everybody across the world is making Epstein. Trevor Noah made a great bit about Epstein. You guys all, but you think you're so clever. <laughs> that is the one thing I, I love watching Bill Clinton get angry. That is so funny. Oh, yeah. Oh. I mean, he does have a bizarre charisma. To, you know, this was so paranoia-inducing, this whole thing, and it should be paranoia-inducing, that I first started listening. I mean, I was following Epstein, obviously, and then I, I got I, I checked out this, this podcast I've mentioned several times now on a flight to the UK. I was taking a, a brief trip to the UK. And I was in London for a couple of days, and then I went to Belfast, and the day I get to Belfast was the same day that the, one of Epstein's victims said that one of the men that she was also victimized by was uh, George Mitchell, which is like one of the only people on the list, like whatever. I mean, George Mitchell is not, you know, he's, we're not talking about, you know, Lula here, but you know, I, he wouldn't be first in my mind of somebody to be mixed up in that, frankly. And it was kind of depressing. And so I, 
I literally walk on this street to where, you know, where my friend is in, in Belfast. And I, I, I mean, I think I realized it beforehand where he was a fellow at and where I was going to go record an interview. And I walk in and it's, and because of course, I mean, George Mitchell helped create peace in Northern Ireland. So it's like the uh, George Mitchell Institute at Belfast University. As soon as I, you know, the Jason Bourne music went off in my head. Uh, wasn't Hillary Clinton's main project when she was first lady universal health care? Very conservative, don't you see? Well, actually, her plan was along the Obama continuum of a massive convoluted public-private partnership. But uh, yes, if you look at the totality of Hillary Clinton's record, including profoundly strong support for quote-unquote welfare reform, support for NAFTA, PNTR with China, and CAFTA, uh, and as well as, my God, I don't even want to get into her foreign policy under the Obama administration, uh, yes. And even her path towards universal health care was criticized from the left by Nancy Pelosi in 1993. So I don't know if that took you as far as you wanted it to go. Jesse Waters is a bad person. Here he is. Even his own mother apparently isn't sacred. A new edition of Mom Texts. And we have so many. This is just part one. Part two is tomorrow. She's been on a real tear. Number one. Jesse, stop making... Content is hard to come by at Fox. Yeah. Sweeping statements about individuals you don't know. <laughs> you are sounding like Joe McCarthy, Ooh. an individual you clearly need to undertake some research about. Weren't you a history major? <laughs> wow. Ouch. But that's your mother? Oh, yeah. I hope your squad criticism can be just a tad more measured today. Perhaps try not to communicate such disdain <laughs> for diversity. Please don't sound like an old white guy who lacks any understanding. Well, they even put her, her typos in there. Wow. But I mean... There's the, the dislike is going both ways here. Don't sound like an old white guy who lacks any understanding of otherness. Love you so. Otherness? Yes, oh, that's a big in my family. Otherness. I hope you have some time to speak with Dana about the drift that has occurred because of her absence. <laughs> I suggest that you stop the one upsman business with Juan and then oh. everyone listen with greater care and stop disparaging the other party in such black and white rhetoric. I am not a wretched human because I am a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. Wow. I don't think you have any She's idea how going. strident and screaming you are. You are struggling, honey bun. <laughs> <laughs> She's and awesome. Yeah, she, she... I think you just said something terribly inappropriate, but I missed it. Good show. <laughs> I think the last one was oh, actually man. her just being sarcastic. Basically, she's ashamed of her son, and so uh, and rightfully so. Go on, Chapo, Mrs. Waters. Yeah, go on, yeah. Chapo, Miss Waters. <laughs> God. It also tells you that I feel like this indicates that, like, these people know that they're just like serving up like the most vile crap every day, and like they just don't care. It's complete nihilism. Oh, Jesse doesn't care. Oh no, not at all. No, so shout out Ryan Grip, uh, <laughs> and Sean Spicer for you know breaking it up before anyone got hurt. I said earlier, right? I said earlier that um. You know, I, I really would look at the after the Republicans lost in 2012. There's a great new, actually, frontline documentary on the Trump approach, uh, how immigration became the center and xenophobia became the center of the Trump campaign and strategy. And there's a great montage of after 2012, even on Fox News, Sean Hannity saying we need immigration reform. Of course, there's a clip of Trump saying, in many respects, the world has changed. Like the, the lesson from 2012 was that we understand this country is changing demographically. We need to get back to the George W. Bush strategy. I mean, people forget George W. Bush won, the, uh, won uh, more Muslim voters than Al Gore in 2000. And he was, he did not win, but he was like competitive with Hispanic voters in both elections. And obviously part of that was the simple reason, uh, you know, that he wasn't overtly bigoted towards them uh, in terms of his campaign strategy, uh, campaign rhetoric. So, but the lesson of the Trump era 
and the lesson, uh, the other, the other strong tendency in Republican politics, obviously, you know, and you have to correlate this with the Roberts Court gutting the Voting Rights Act with all these gerrymandering, uh, gerrymandering efforts across the states. The Republicans are like, look, how do we keep winning? We ethnically engineer the electorate. It is strategic. It is a strategic white supremacy. And of course it matters, you know, whether people believe it or not in some respects, but this is why there's no functional difference uh, between any member of the Republican Party unless they actually vote against this stuff and none of them do. Um, this is Laura Ingram expressing precisely that. There was an excellent result for Democrats in Virginia and really across the country in many areas, although a terrible one in Seattle, I will say. Uh, picking Amazon over Shama Sawant is a mind-blowingly stupid choice. Come on, Seattle. Come on, Seattle. But, um, and of course, it was fought on many issues. Kentucky Medicaid expansion, uh, protecting that. Bevin's war against the teachers. Uh, but look at how Laura Ingram views the election. And that brings us to the great Commonwealth of Virginia. Democrats took control of both state houses, giving them full control of the entire government for the first time since 1994. Now, the road to Democrat dominance in the Commonwealth was paved long before Trump took the presidency. The undeniable fact is that demographic changes throughout the state, but especially in Northern Virginia, have altered what was once a moderate to right of center state and it made it really a petri dish for radical left-wing ideas. Virginia's foreign-born population nearly doubled from 2000 to 2017, and these immigrants are mostly concentrated in Northern Virginia, Fairfax County, Loudoun County, Prince William County, outside of DC, and they are altering the demographic makeup of the state and, as the Washington Post and others have pointed out, the electorate. And the newspaper of record here, again, the Washington Post, noted that Fairfax County, a third of the residents there are now foreign born. Half of elementary school students there speak a foreign language at home, 182 languages uh, in total spoken, and one of those is spoken in uh, that huge percentage. And since immigrants are more likely to vote Democrat, well, this, of course, has dragged the electorate to the left. It's just a fact of life. But the shift left has also been aided by women, especially in the suburbs, who tend also to vote Democrat. This is something Trump absolutely needs to pay attention to and not just wave it away. I think Trump is paying attention to Oh, uh, yeah. Laura. Trust me, Laura. I pay Trust me. close attention. I got my best people on this. I got my best. Donald Trump is recently, uh, according to a report from Ken Klippenstein, wants to use live ammunition on people at the border. By the way, I do want to just say in reference to Israel uh, conversation earlier, it is incredible to me that some people who will defend Israel's every single action to the death and then are petrified when Donald Trump is like, basically, I'd like to do a little bit of Israel here at the border. I think that's something to keep in mind. But uh, this is it. This is the energy of it. It's a strategic white supremacy. And it is a recognition. It's like, it's like look at a brand. The base, McDonald's might look at overall survey data and go more and more people say they're concerned about their health and healthcare costs are skyrocketing. And if we want to operate in different areas, some people want to get on regimes. We need to talk to them. We should have a salad menu. Of course, their salad menu ends up having, uh, I think, as many calories almost as the burger. But then it's like the base of McDonald's is the burger and fries. How are you going to get rid of that? The structural base of the Republican Party is a relationship between oligarchs and white and religious identity politics. Now, there's different threads. I think there's a handful of people now. It used to be there was a handful of like libertarian type people who were oligarch on economics and slightly socially tolerant. Now you can find occasionally some people who are smart policy people and they want a uh, protectionist trade policies and they're actually not xenophobes and they still want, you know, an equal civil society. But again, that ain't the electorate. If you're a, if you are a non-wealthy person voting for the Republican party, 
Let's be real about why you're voting, just as we need to be real about all the things that Democrats have done to create those conditions. We got to be real about both. But, you know, it's not an either or story. It's always both and. So but the elites see that they're not going to be able to make that broader pivot. Uh, and in fact, it's a much smarter place just as a pure political level. Like the idea that they really thought we are going to continue with savage predatory capitalism and then sort of challenge xenophobia is delusional. <laughs> I mean, what you could do is reinforce xenophobia and challenge savage capitalism, which Trump did rhetorically. And I got to tell you, if they actually followed through on that agenda, it, we would be in a much scarier place than we are today. Um, but that's what you see on Fox. All right. I love this last sound of the day. Um, let's go to number nine. Uh, Mayo Pete is absolutely my least favorite person running for president. This is really underlined for me. I watched uh, some of Tulsi Gabbard on The View and we won't play it, but I, you know, obviously I don't like Tulsi Gabbard. I've got huge criticisms of her, but I thought I, that whole Russian asset stuff is really disgusting and toxic. And she actually handled herself pretty well uh, in that interview. And that really did underline. Um, we didn't even play Andrew Yang's throwing Julian Assange under the bus. What a great dynamic guy that is. But Pete Buttigieg is the worst of all possible things. Uh, he's a corporatist. He's uh, cozy with Mark Zuckerberg and the, Facebook. He was former naval intelligence. I'm former sure naval those intelligence. Remain. Former McKinsey. The guy barely, and this is another thing that's incredible to me. This guy barely has any record. He's 35 years old, I think. What is he? 38. This is a, this is a fucking joke. That he's even running for president. He is the mayor of a college town. This is a joke. To the extent he has any actual record, other than he's you know gotten a lot of degrees and written a book and is tight with Facebook, it is a record filled with profound racial problems. And also, incidentally, gentrification. But let's just stick with all of the policing and racism issues. Like appeasing a uh, coup of racist cops, basically. That's how the story reads, and I would read TYT politics on it, Dave. And I don't mean just read. It's not opinion. They have the reporting. So the African-American community in the Democratic primary is not impressed with this guy. Now, there's two things I always say. One is it's horrifically stupid to speak about the black electorate as a monolith and it's horrifically stupid to speak about any electorate as a monolith there are vast class geographic and ideological differences and number uh two uh yeah um there is a rational reason why any demographic is you know like it makes total sense why as an example in this primary uh I don't like him, but I totally understand why Biden is popular. And I totally understand why Sanders is popular. There is no reason why Pete Buttigieg should be popular. I mean, really with anybody. But if you are completely unknown and your primary introduction is to the extent this guy has any record being the mayor of a college town and involves appeasing a racist white coup. Yeah, I'm going to say probably not a super stoked option uh, for African-American voters. And by the way, in such a way that actually could cut across geographic and ideological differences, because what the hell else is there else to say? Pete's interaction with the African-American community is aiding apparently racist police officers and supporting gentrification. People around him have said this is homophobia, which is stunning because it is the, the worst of both worlds, right? It is, it is the, a great example of what you see, unfortunately, from all quarters, right? Like, oh, no, you can't ask for the, you know, WFP totals. That's race. You know, they're just the shockingly cynical deployment of pseudo woke politics in any context to cover for power and to distract from political and policy questions, which does happen across the board. And then conversely, a actual raw unmitigated example of essentialist racism 
towards the African American community of which I actually don't think there is any other example in this primary cycle that would come close to that. I think everything else has either been, I mean, Biden's had plenty of stuff, but that's because he's dealing with a long record of racism and he doesn't know what the hell he's saying half of the time. This has been a actual campaign strategy. We're going to get our campaign officials on Twitter and say slick shit like, oh, I wonder why they don't like Pete. To which everybody could say, maybe because Pete presided over a fucking racist police force. You morons. By the way, all poll numbers show that that supposed myth of some special homophobia in the African-American community, which was always a exaggerated trope and highly racialized to begin with. Guess what? Those numbers are tracking with the rest of the Democratic electorate. So you won't have that to hide behind anymore. So the variable isn't skin color? No, the variable shockingly was actually not like a melanin density in terms of hating gay people. What a shock. I got to tell you, the only person who slightly upped his uh, estimation in my eyes during this campaign cycle uh, is Julian Castro. And uh, here he is with <laughs> Trevor Noah uh, going into Mayo Pete. Mayor Pete Buttigieg made some news when he said he thinks that the Democratic race is now a two-horse race. He said it's between him and Elizabeth Warren. Many were like, wow, you've just written off Biden, you've written off everybody else. And he said... Uh, Trevor, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, the person who's surging in all polls, uh, who has always been one of the three main contenders of the race, who just had the three most significant young leaders in America endorse him. That's the other guy it's you're crazy, looking for, man. Trevor. That's why uh, Trevor gets paid the big bucks, folks. Indeed. Many were like, wow, you've just written off Biden, you've written off everybody else, and he said, this is what I'm doing. Was it strange for you uh, having Buttigieg say that, especially considering that you are a mayor of a much bigger town? And you guys had a little, little spat back and forth where he said, you said he doesn't have a great relationship with black voters. You know, you, you pointed to the incidents that have occurred in South Bend. He then said to you, well, why not come out to my neck of the woods and I'll show you around? Have you taken him up on that? Uh, no, and well, and uh, what, do you, what do you think you have th that, is, that differs to him with regards to the experience of being a mayor? Uh, well, I actually have a good track record with black voters and with folks that I worked with in San yes! Antonio, uh, which I think is different. And my point was that we're going to need a nominee that can resonate in the African-American community. Black women have been those powering our victories everywhere from Alabama to, you know, the 2018 wins. And so what I said was that it's risky to have a candidate at the top of the ticket that cannot speak to, in a convincing way, those different communities. Uh -huh. And, you know, I think the track record is there on his end. Uh, in San Antonio, my experience was the exact opposite of that. In fact, I got appointed to the Obama administration as housing secretary largely because of the work that we did on the east side of San Antonio, which Eesh. traditionally was the African-American part of town. Right. And so I just think the track records are different. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that there's some things that he's done that are good things, and I have a lot of respect <laughs> for Mayor Buttigieg. But I do think that our experience level is different. You know, I don't need to go see uh, South Bend. I saw a hundred different cities when I was HUD secretary, right. and I, I was mayor of a, a city that's 14 times larger than South Bend. In fact, we could almost fit we could almost fit South Bend in our Alamo Dome in San Antonio. <laughs> right, so, you know. I mean, look, I'm going to stipulate. Look, his his HUD secretary record was not good, and I would be skeptical about what he was doing as mayor. To be honest, just because his record. I mean, look, he's of the he is not a progressive politician traditionally of the past, but everything else he said in that clip is to the tenth power. It could not be more true. And the media honeymoon and pass on Peach Buttigieg needs to stop and people actually need to look seriously at his record because in some ways it, it fuses the worst of all. I mean, he appeased white identity machine politics, yeah. police brutality, and is as cozy as you could possibly be with the most predatory, dangerous tech monopolies in the modern world, not even to mention the whole militaristic McKinsey dimension. He is awful and saying it's about homophobia when the only thing apparent to about his record is race problems is uh, it's a race problem in it his sounds, campaign. It, 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 that is it. 
Asking uh, Castro to come to his neck of the woods sounds vaguely threatening when you consider it, what happened, which is, let's see if I can recite this. Um, Pete gets, becomes mayor. Uh, a scandal involving the first black uh, police chief uh, as the, that black police chief recorded subordinates being racist uh, right. underneath, uh, beneath him. Right. Pete fired that guy. One of the racist cops on the tapes runs for, uh, runs for sheriff later. Um, that guy is funded by, um, also Pete's main fundraiser. So what's going on there? I don't know. It's that it looks, uh, looks a little fishy from my neck of the woods. But yeah. Read Jonathan Larson's TYT read stuff. Read Jonathan Larson's TYT stuff. Oh, and share it with, uh, your, uh, I mean, what is that? Is that, that's also PMC, I would guess. Yeah. yeah. You're oh, less oh, politically definitely. engaged PMC. Today. Yeah. What's the TYT? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, they actually won't know enough to like dismiss it. So, like, give them the stuff about, hey, your Pete Buttigieg guy, he has a huge racist cop problem, and uh, he should go away and let the uh, the, the real candidates. I saw a guy in Prospect Heights Indeed. with his book bag, and he was had a, a Warren button and then a Pete button right under oh. it. He's wearing cargo shorts. He had IPA belly. That is Very really sad. the type of thing. Dark that image, folks. Makes Sorry me, to end it on that. Wow, that's depressing. That makes me want to read about Pol Pot when I hear about people <laughs> like that. Um, all right, really quick, we'll take one call and do a few IMs, but we do. We're right up against the clock, folks. So let me pick a call at random. You are calling from a three oh eight area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Kowalski. Hey! What's up, Kowalski? Great to hear from you. What's on your mind? I just want to say I think this has been one of the best weeks ever. Tell me about it. I love it. What's happening? Well, okay. From what I can tell, my campaign hasn't officially like started, but I have been making inroads. Awesome. Trump's like progressivism is easily adaptable to like Sanders. Like, extremely adaptable. Right. Explaining a few things about Sanders to Trump supporters, he's like their second pick. He ain't yep. establishment. Uh, even this latest immigration thing, that was very similar to what I wanted to talk about before my call was dropped like a week ago or something. Yeah. That is something that Trump supporters actually kind of like because it does take care of the labor aspect. And as I kind of pointed out to him, with Republicans holding all three, you know, branches, they still couldn't get the wall. So what do you think is going to happen in the next four years? Pragmatic, you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Like, if that is not a hopeful thing, I'm not sure what is. Also, you know, the complete and total collapse of oligarchic support across Kentucky is also really awesome. Yeah, that was so, great. I was that was I mean, we got to keep a close eye on that, though, because I think Republicans are going to try to steal that one. But I think uh that was a that was I mean Kentucky was definitely a great result and a really good signal for sure. Kowalski, keep us posted, and and as it and as it progresses, you got to start giving us information on social media accounts and how people can donate and stuff like that. Oh, I definitely will. We're going to rebuild the progressive wing of the Republican Party, and I don't care if I have to burn everything else down in the process. <laughs> yes, I love it. Thank you, man. Have a great Farmers day. and ranchers are coming out of the hills, boys. Have a good one. For yeah. You. Awesome. Have a good one. Man, I love Kowalski. I am all about that. Rebuild the progressive Republican Party. All right. Final couple of IMs. Did you guys watch the interview those two Jordan Peterson fanboys did with Noam Chomsky? <laughs> no. <laughs> I saw so clips of it. Uh, all I could think of is how much more worthwhile it would have been to get you, Michael, to interview Chomsky instead of these dorks. Have you ever reached out to him about doing an interview for TMBS? No, but we, I mean, we really ought to. Now's really. the time. <laughs> Seriously. We really, really ought to. He was on with uh, Mehdi Hassan. It was really good. No, he's amazing. I guess I, my excuses, and it's a bad excuse, is I just sort of like assume. My understanding with him is that he basically like, you know, some people to be on, you know, we've we've done well. Some people... You know, you don't necessarily say yes to everything. You got to work to get it. My understanding is he does say yes to pretty much everything, which is why it's like, you know, 
It might be like six months in the future that you get them, but we'll, we will work on that. We should. Hey, Michael, looking forward to attending TMBS in Philly. I know Emma and Crystal are for Bernie, but are we going to see a Warren Yang Tulsi bloodbath? Uh, no. I can actually assure you that. No. Shout out to my hometown of Jersey for voting for strict regulations on Airbnb rentals. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Colin from Nebraska. There are more tra- tax brackets for labor than for capital. Horrendous. Yes. Your kink shaming is part of my kink. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Final. <laughs> final. I am of the day. Looking for this. Colorado guy. If taxing multi-billionaires is unfairly punitive, what do we call lifelong paycheck to paycheck servitude or being a medical bill away from complete financial ruin. Michael, how do we get people to realize that not only is capitalism never put humanity or equality above profits, but they will always actively dismiss such things. Well, I think you just put it beautifully. That's a fucking good point. See you guys tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna and my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was made For the option where you don't get 